I have no problem taking that direction. Okay. So I'll moved talk. by Ferguson, second by Powers. Powers. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ferguson. Now, Councillor Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is very exciting and to have the uh, movement in uh, brownfield remediation uh, taking place is uh, is something I think to be very proud of. Uh, the city of Hamilton started talking about brownfields uh, some years ago and other communities didn't know what we were talking about or didn't want to know, uh, but it has since become fashionable to do so uh, and uh, very necessary for our own community. We have huge acreage or hectoreage or whatever we call it uh, across the northerly section of the city. Uh, specifically Ward 3 and, and points uh, east and west that uh, can be very, very uh, integral uh, parts of uh, future economic success of the community and uh, perhaps not all for industrial uses as we know, but uh, uh, this and previous councils have taken steps to make it easier for these things to happen, which is excellent. That people like uh, Mr. Mancia uh, bringing his uh, expertise to bear on such projects as this makes it uh, happen as well. So I hope this can be a, an example of what we can yep. do and uh, that we see a lot more of it. I think it would be remiss of us not to mention the fact that you were mayor when a lot of this, the foundation of this was basically established and for that we should be uh, thanking you as well, sir. Thank you. And there, and there were a few projects but, but the momentum yep. is with you now and uh, that's exciting and I, I would certainly want to recognize uh, Mr. Morelli's uh, role in this. I was aware of that. So, and, Tom has added to that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I just may add in closing, just, um, you know, we, we initiated this project uh, with economic development staff and hoping that, you know, we can uh, have some interest. But uh, believe it or not, we, we have 50% of the, the site is already reserved for new companies or existing companies that want to move into that site. So, it, you know, it is, the race program is working because we throw that as, as sort of a carrot and how over the 10 years. Um, and, and uh, you know, we look forward to moving on, put those services in, uh, and, and finishing off the balance of that subdivision. And hopefully I have an opportunity doing a few more of these. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Mancha, we do have uh, one more speaker. Sorry, Mayor, Mayor Bertino. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So this relates to um, uh, the motion that I put forward regarding a blue ribbon panel on, uh, on brownfields, because this is the kind of conversation that I think very knowledgeable people such as Mr. Mancha, that you know the people who are, who are working and, and confronted with the, the issues, I think can sit together and bring forward a, a very useful report, not only for Hamilton, but uh, perhaps right across the province. So, so thank you, uh, Serge, for uh, coming yeah. before us and and uh, bringing some light to what has been a very, uh, you know, since the the end of the era of those companies, a, a rather dark and certainly underutilized area. So we can bring it back to life. More power. Thanks so much. And Mr. Mayor, through you, Mr. Chair, there's also other pockets that we are working on beyond the Hamilton, Stony Creek, Dundas, uh, just the, the peripheries of, of, the, uh, of the city that require this kind of uh, redevelopment. There's other industrial parks. Let's, let's face it, they're industrial, they're going to maintain industrial. We clean them up to a certain level. Unfortunately, they may or may not get recontaminated. So that's key. And I think Councillor Marula. Uh, and Collins and uh, Morelli who helped me along with this one. Appreciated that from the get-go with staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manchia. May I have a motion to uh, receive the presentation moved by Powers, seconded by Morrow. Uh, all in favor? Carried. Carried. May I have a motion to, um, oh sorry, I would advise the committee that uh, item 8.1 of today's agenda deals with the environment city race program. Now we're moving on to um, item 7. I would now call uh, Norm Schlien uh, to speak to item 7.1 and to introduce the present presenters. Uh, Councilor Johnson. Just out of interest, do you want to deal with 8.1 right now while we have the applicant in the I, I have audience no problem so that doing that. So uh, moved by, um, to move it up, moved by Johnson, second by Farr, all in favor? Carried. Carried. On 8.1, moved by Morrill, and uh, seconded by McCaddy, all in favor? Yes. Yeah, just on uh, 8.1, 8 Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm fully in support of it. But um, it, it's, I'm told it's all administrative, um, and it's actually entitled administrative changes, which are great. Mm -hmm. However, you, you attach a multi-page document showing the race program, but you can't possibly understand where the changes are. Is there any particular reason why you don't highlight the changes just so we can see them? Or Neil or use, Norm? Use Who? tracking? 
Neil? Uh, so that we can see where the changes are? Because it didn't mean anything to me, <laughs> wasting all that paper to reproduce the whole document. We don't have a clue where Look to at look. that. You are environmentally sensitive. That's good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Recognizing that. Uh, I've been waiting a long time for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, through you, Mr. Through Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, what we'll do immediately after uh, this is we'll uh, prepare a synopsis in an email and send it to all of Council and highlight the specific changes for you. Okay, but just a suggestion in the future. Somehow in these administrative changes, just so we can find them, just highlight them or use track changes feature on Microsoft uh, Office to be able to easily... Right, okay. we'll, we'll do that going forward, but we'll get that email out to you today. All right, so all in favor? Go, oh, Councillor Farr. I thought it would be prudent since Neil's here just to, uh, for the record, uh, uh, note that uh, none of our erase programs are, are compromised through what's before us here, that it is uh, more or less almost like a, a, a housekeeping. It, uh, it's uh, it's uh, prudent for people like Serge to move forward and that we're not in any way uh, compromising any uh, Ministry of Environment standards as well. So to get Neil on the record might be good before we hopefully unanimously approve what's before us. All right. So, all in favor? And it was it was already recorded. Uh, through you to Neil. Oh, Neil. Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, we are not compromising anything. Actually, uh, with this uh, risk assessment approach, uh, we will be using a peer review model, and we will get to select a peer review. So, uh, this is uh, this is a, a very important step in dealing with brownfields on a larger scale in the city and. Uh, and we're quite confident that these changes are, are, uh, are perfectly acceptable. In fact, many of them are in use in other municipalities. Mm -hmm. And with what's, just as a follow-up through you, and briefly to Neil, with what's before us, will the city see more uh, urban core type companies come forward with uh, what we have here? You, you, you confident from an economic development perspective? Neil? Through Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, yes we will, uh, particularly if the use isn't changing, if it's going from industrial to industrial, this will significantly speed up the process. In fact, Mr. Mancher relates that this takes, uh, this is going down to about one month versus a three month uh, delay for the record of site conditions, so it really accelerates uh, the process significantly. Okay. Happy to move it. Uh, we already have a, a motion on the floor, so all, all, all in favor? Carried. Uh, carried. Um, now we're moving on to uh, the presentations. Uh, Norm uh, Schlian to speak to item 7.1 and uh, introduce the presenters. Good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, members of council. It's my distinct pleasure this morning to introduce Sheila Botting. Um, Sheila Botting is the senior practice partner, client cabinet and partner and national leader for Deloitte Real Estate. And she's responsible for the full Deloitte team that provides real estate advisory valuation corporate real estate and transaction services to the marketplace. Sheila has a very extensive resume and I promised her that I wasn't going to read it all off to you today, but uh, what I do want to tell you is that Sheila is renowned in her knowledge and expertise, expertise in commercial real estate and economic development. And as you'll see this morning, very passionate about the role of manufacturing in Ontario and its importance in the province's continued prosperity and competitiveness. So as Sheila gets ready, I'll uh, just make one more, one more point in that uh, it's been about 10 years since we did a, an overall assessment of our manufacturing uh, sector and um, this purpose of the study was basically to figure out where we are now and where we are going forward and with that I will uh, turn it over to Sheila. Thank you. Sheila, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Deputy Mayor and members of Council. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you today about the future of manufacturing for Hamilton. And if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'll share with you this is as much a personal story as it is a Hamilton story. In the 1920s, my newly graduated grandfather from the city of uh, uh, Toronto's University Engineering Faculty came to Hamilton to create his fortune. He worked with International Harvester and looked out at the bay and saw the Canada steamship lines going in and out of the port and said, you know, this is a place that I want to be. My second grandfather moved here from Montreal in the 40s. Family was here and life prospered tremendously in Hamilton. Walt Disney even lived in my mother's neighborhood, so she was very excited. Sadly today, of all of my relatives who were here in Hamilton, while 80% of us still live in the area, nobody works in Hamilton. We've all gone elsewhere to find our jobs and our future. What I'd like to talk to you about today is how manufacturing and the, certainly the global economy is changing and it's providing more opportunities that Hamilton can take advantage of. 
the change in the global environment, the change in manufacturing, through a very carefully orchestrated strategy on economic development focused at advanced manufacturing presents tremendous opportunities. We'll talk about that shifting landscape, Canadian manufacturing, some of the assets, and I'll be candid with you on the assets here in Hamilton and some of the challenges. I also share with you the future of productivity. Deloitte has done tremendous work in this area, and there's some gems of knowledge out of that that I think will benefit Hamilton substantially. Then, of course, we have recommendations. We have a giant fat book you're welcome to read that has all of the details in it, and we also have a PowerPoint, this PowerPoint, with some of the information. So the shifting global manufacturing landscape. And you say manufacturing. Well, manufacturing is much more than the traditional manufacturing that we're all used to. And in fact, today it's actually classified as a cluster of economic activities encompassing much more than manufacturing alone. It includes re research and development, production, sales, distribution, logistics, customer service, marketing, and support. It's more than just the, the manufacturing of the physical products, but it's right through the delivery of services and the distribution. IT and technology in and of itself has substantially transformed virtually all aspects of our economy from office markets, retail markets, but also in the industrial markets. And that introduction of technology has made significant changes on modeling and simulation in the manufacturing process, innovation and global supply chain, and the rapid flexibility in the production process. All you have to say is 3D printing, and right away that tells you what advanced manufacturing can become. We're thinking of putting 3D printers in our own office environment. So suddenly the blend of what is a traditional manufacturing into what we're doing today is very different. So you have to kind of think about it in a very different light. In fact, The Economist magazine calls this the third industrial revolution. Manufacturing is going digital, remarkable new technologies are converging. And in fact, the factory of the future will be increasingly focused on new processes and products. Think additive manufacturing, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, and genetic engineering. It's much more than we call traditional manufacturing. Deloitte has done tremendous work on manufacturing around the world. In 2012, we did a report for the World Economic Forum that looked at, in fact, all the countries around the world and how we stack up from a manufacturing perspective. And when you look at all the countries around the world, some of the key success factors, of course, are strong infrastructure, foreign direct investment, resources, affordable energy, innovation, human capital, and most importantly for today, the strategic use of public policy for economic development. And in fact, North America is becoming increasingly competitive in the global manufacturing world. When you look at some of the reshoring opportunities and why there could be reshoring, you've seen recent studies that have shown that China and Asia is becoming increasingly challenging for some manufacturing, particularly those manufacturing items at the high end of the food chain. Not the, you know, the dollar store production retail items, but at the high end of the food chain, that's really an opportunity. You just think about the tsunami and the impact on Japan, you know that we have supply chain challenges in bringing product over from, from the Asian markets. Labor costs have increased, often 10% a year in some of the Chinese markets. So suddenly now, the southern US and Mexico are looking pretty appealing. And then of course, there's the red tape and regulation and competition and innovation. You weigh off North America against that and you say, of course we're strong. We have strong R&D, we have strong innovation, we have world-class universities and labs, infrastructure, supplier network. We're very talented. We have a large middle class that has a strong consumer network to buy the product, along with strong intellectual property and quality health care. Yeah. Real strong case for North America. You further drill that down, and the Deloitte work says that we can do 3.8 million new jobs in North America through a combined mechanism. And then you say, how do we fit up in Canada? Where's Canada's role? Well, currently we're seventh in the world in manufacturing, with the forecast going to the eighth position. That's still really good. In fact, South America, Brazil is popping up, which is moving us to a further uh, down the food chain. Still very solid for Canada. When you look at the reshoring opportunities back to Canada, you think of all of those things that we just spoke about, and if you take the very scientific method, the rule of, uh, rule of thumb, 10% of U.S. jobs or the overall jobs can come to Canada, 385,000 jobs. And guess where they could potentially come to? There's no reason why Ontario and central Canada can't benefit because, of course, we have the backbone of the Canadian economy around these efforts. 
So now you're going to say, well, what about Hamilton? How can we play in this game? What are the opportunities for Hamilton? And I think it's really important to understand your assets, strengths, and opportunities. So I'll talk to those again really quickly because I'm sure you know most of them already, but I'll reinforce those. And then the yeah buts after that. So of course we know the region is incredible. We know that Hamilton's GDP growth is very strong at 2.3% and forecast to be one of the strongest communities in Ontario until 2017. We know that it's one of the lowest unemployment rates certainly um, in Ontario at now 6% uh, in January which is a great number so very solid in terms of the unemployment rate. We know we're close to all of the major U.S. and Canadian markets, so we can move product around very quickly and very efficiently. We know that the infrastructure, certainly from the Port of Hamilton, is solid with the airport, the highways, and the rail lines, all very solid, again, to move products, services, and goods through the region. The, of course, the port, being the fourth largest port in Canada, is exciting and has tremendous opportunity. Then you look at, of course, the colleges and universities, healthcare, again, very substantive as a backbone and a catalyst for more opportunities. Again, I'll use the word catalyst, so for areas like biosciences, having this backbone is really, really important. When you start drilling into some of the industries in Hamilton, you can see that we in fact do have a fairly diverse um, manufacturing sector from across all sectors, from machinery and equipment through to food services and fabricated metals. And in fact, the industrial markets here in Canada are in Hamilton at 38 million square feet of space are among the largest in the Western GTA. Now this is just the least market that the brokers will actually track. It does not include the owned market like the Arcelors and others, which of course, as you know, are probably double or triple the size of the leased market. But it's still a very solid leased market. You know that in 2013, 750,000 square feet of new industrial space was added and it was great to hear about the brownfield strategy as well in terms of being able to add product to the market. Very exciting in terms of the potential. And then of course the low development charges, real estate cost, development charges keeping them low, really important. <laughs> Can't stress how important that is. Not all communities in Ontario have that benefit. When you look at the sales price per square foot in terms of the industrial product itself, you can see actually it's popped up. So there's been a lot of appetite here for the Hamilton marketplace. But the good news is it's still lower than the overall GTA West markets of Mississauga, Milton, and Oakville and Burlington. The Conference Board of Canada forecasts that manufacturing in Hamilton will improve significantly with 54,300 jobs by 2017. And of course the investments by Canada Bread, Maple Leaf, Tim Hortons and others of course just fuel to those forecasts. Some of the, here's just some of the uh, large additions which you all know about tremendously. This plan is part of the Ontario Manufacturing Cluster, the Advanced Manufacturing Cluster. And again, when you start looking at the individual components, you can see that primary metal still drives the, both the revenue and employment here in Hamilton. So it's a great starting point, but when you start moving beyond that and consider some of the other components, it's very exciting. Food and beverages, metal fabrication, and transportation and machinery. When you look at some of the export opportunity, however, this is where we might put our minds to better opportunities. When you look at the U.S. counts for 77% of all U.S. Uh, of all Ontario exports, and here in Hamilton, 80% of our exports go to the U.S., you know, a wise business person would say maybe we need to export our product elsewhere around the world. Maybe there's a better play in terms of manufacturing product for the European and other markets in the world to actually fragment and, and broaden our distribution networks and provide greater stability. And when I show a little video for you later, remember that fact because it'll be very important in a long-term strategy. When you look at foreign direct investment, in my world it's known as site selection and it's known when large users want to come into the Ontario market or the Quebec market and where are they going to invest and why are they going to invest in that area. Obviously it's very important to have an incredibly focused site selection strategy, a very careful strategy because it's a very competitive world. I can assure you because that's a very large chunk of our business is that when a company comes down into one of the Canadian provinces versus to some of the U.S. locations, it's a feeding frenzy with respect to where they go. So making sure that we can capture some of those opportunities, be it new investment or be it reinvestment of some of our existing facilities very carefully. 
So now the, some of the vulnerabilities, and I'm sure you probably know these, but from a real estate person's perspective, some of these are very quite pronounced. The big one is the tax rate, property taxes. And let me explain to you why property taxes matter, and especially given a market where we have a very low vacancy rate in Hamilton, we'd like to have a lot of new industrial products. So you would like to attract the pension funds and the large investors that we all do our business with and say, come to Hamilton and build product. You take on the other side, the tenant or the user side of the equation wanting to come here, and the tenant and user from their occupancy costs will only pay so much money. And if a lot of that is taken up in taxes, they'll pay very little in terms of the rent for that equation within the competitive market. And that rent has to be of a certain magnitude in order to justify new development or the redevelopment of facilities. So that's why this matters to have a very competitive tax rate within the market within which you're operating, especially if you'd like to attract some of the real estate investment dollars. And of course, this is very important because at the end of last year, the vacancy rate here for industrial product was 2.8%. A balanced market is in the 6 to 7% range. So you clearly have a market where you need new product added to the Hamilton market. So you can attract some of the large users from industrial to advanced manufacturing to all of the other components. Another big issue is here in Ontario, we have uh, been ranked as the fifth for the independent business red tape report. And in fact, Ontario employers face approximately 385,000 requirements from different levels of government with respect to how they're going to address the issues. So as soon as you put red tape in front of a, a business and an entrepreneurial activity, clearly you have some challenges. The labor union considerations in Hamilton are often identified as a key issue for some of the major employers wanting to move into the marketplace. And some of the uh, more lax areas south of the border can be very competitive and appealing. Then, of course, you have the perceptions when you look across the bay. Now, my dad loves these pictures. He loves looking across the bay because he says, this is prosperity. Of course, you need to have that. But when you go to the uh, big pension fund dollars out of uh, Toronto and the U.S. and they come across the bay, they say, you know, maybe we could have a prettier picture. So this goes to the branding opportunity that you have in terms of painting a prettier picture to spruce it up to make it more interesting. This is really important. Um, in terms of developing a strategy. And where the opportunity is, is to reposition to the innovation and advanced manufacturing sector to really show a community that embraces that, that wants to move forward on that, and actually balance the quality of life with a sustainable environment. We know living here that Hamilton has all those things to offer. It's important to convey that as part of a branding strategy. So those are the highlights of our study. It was like bang, 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 rapid fire on all of the key facts. What I'd like to share with you is something very important. At Deloitte, we spend a lot of our own personal time and energy and research, and I'm personally involved in looking at the future of Canada. And what can we do as a country to be much more competitive within the global world? So I've got a video. It's two minutes. If you want to watch it again, show your friends, share it with people. It's sitting on the Deloitte website, so you can get it at any point in time. But it really talks to productivity and how Canada as a country can advance. And if you put your advanced manufacturing lens to this, there's significant um, ability here for Hamilton. Several decades ago, something strange happened in Canada. We started becoming less productive than our neighbors. Productivity, which is the average value produced per hour worked, is the most important driver to our prosperity and the safeguard to our standard of living. But for years now, our productivity rate has been growing less quickly than many other countries. At first, the decrease was small. It was hardly noticeable. But over time, the gap has grown. Now, every hour of work in Canada generates $13 less than in the United States. It's worth $29 less than Norway. These numbers matter because unless we act now, our children will be the first generation of Canadians with a lower standard of living than their parents. And it's largely because of the gap in productivity. So why is the productivity gap between Canada and other countries so big? Many people think it's due to the size of our businesses and our sector composition. They'll tell you the size of our businesses aren't big enough, and they'll say our sector composition isn't varied enough. But that simply isn't true. Our problem with productivity has little to do with size or sector. It has to do with gazelles and water buffaloes. Here are the facts. Canada is a smart, entrepreneurial nation. We can be nimble, quick, and dynamic. 
our youngest businesses take fearless leaps of faith and grow at stellar rates. These high-producing startups are called gazelles, and Canada has plenty of them. In fact, Canada has one of the highest rates of new business entry in the world, 25% higher than the U.S. We're unstoppable. At least we are for the first five years. Then something happens. Our businesses stop growing. Why? It could be because they stop investing and they stop taking chances. Businesses appear to become complacent. Our gazelles become water buffaloes. And that's our real problem when it comes to productivity. Complacency trumps competitiveness. We avoid risk at any cost, protecting what we have versus pursuing what we want. We don't innovate, we stagnate. Canada needs more growth. A small number of our businesses are generating a disproportionate amount of employment and revenue. We need to fundamentally change how we approach running our businesses. We need to invest in innovation and new capital. We need to expose ourselves to the pressures of international markets. We need to think differently about how we secure new human capital. Deloitte has seen the future of productivity in Canada. A competitive, innovative Canada capable of closing the gap. A Canada capable of making sure the country our children live in tomorrow is just as prosperous as the one we live in today. I think that's a pretty powerful, quick video that capsules, you know, certainly the Canadian situation and an opportunity for us here in Hamilton. When you look at the productivity reports, obviously moving beyond our status quo, taking advantage of great opportunities is very important. Building national and multinational businesses, I spoke to you about how the manufacturers in Hamilton, in fact, distribute 80% to the U.S., needs to be much broader, more widely distributed, so economic development has a real role and opportunity to play there. Investing in new capital equipment and new sites, our brownfield sites, as we heard earlier this morning, and of course the clusters and talented mines. Government has a real role to play here. Government has an investment to make to be the catalyst and help to foster some of these opportunities. And then some of the practical, you know, what can we do in the nuts and bolts side here? With respect to branding and marketing, we spoke to that. Business retention, real programs for the business retention, real communities around advanced manufacturing, bringing people together and creating energy. Philadelphia is probably the best example of this, how the business leaders in that community decided to retain and attract new businesses. And then, of course, there's the investment tra attraction strategy, the site selection, foreign direct investment, and being very aggressive, very purposeful, methodical, and not just waiting for the phone to ring. A lot of the municipalities we, we work with just wait for the phone to ring. That's not a strategy. Hope and prayer is not a strategy. And then, of course, the strategy to enhance skills on labor here within locally. You know, I would be very proud to be able to say that my children and or my grandchildren were able to find tremendous careers and futures here in Hamilton as a result of the strategies developed by the council and the city of Hamilton. A short 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a list of speakers in <laughs> Councillor Johnson, McCaddy, Collins, and Whitehead. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, and thank you very much for your presentation. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, one of the things I'd like to just clarify a few things, if you don't mind. If you can go to the slide of the City of Hamilton market strengths, lowest unemployment rate in Ontario. Yes. I don't know what slide number I would call that. Two, four. I do recall the slide. I'm just not finding it right now, but keep going. Yes. Okay. So it says that we're at 5.7, which is which is well below the um, national unemployment rate of 7%. Were you able to tweeze out whether or not this unemployment rate is based solely on those that are collecting unemployment or those whose unemployment have run out and they're still not working? So this is reported through the government agencies or so, so I believe it's the reported rate that would be those that are on the collection status as opposed to those that have run out. Okay, So it would be on you. the more formal reporting status. Even though it looks like great news, it's still, yeah, no, there's it. still the other side of that coin. Thank you. Um, the other one, City of Hamilton's market strengths, economically diverse industries and sectors. Mm -hmm. 
I notice you have machinery, equipment, miscellaneous, wholesale, the whole bit. One of the things that I advocate quite a lot, because most of my ward is agriculture. And agriculture, we were here not too long ago when we heard from a representative who said that the agriculture is over a billion dollars a year. Were you able to tweeze that one out as well? Yes, so there is a subset strategy on the whole agriculture. I'll say the food services industry as opposed to just the ag piece. And so we have a strategy around that. It's a tremendous opportunity for the city of Hamilton, certainly with respect to the port and our geographic location. And yes, we've interviewed people as part of that sector. So the answer is yes, there is an opportunity there. Okay, thank you for that. And there's also, I guess my concern for that is that Agriculture is not just food. Yep. We also have horse racing. Mm -hmm. We also have all kinds of you know, veterinary, and, that, and uh, there's also those spin-offs of those. So those are one of the things I'd really like to see as a, one of Hamilton's strengths as well, because we do have that. It's very strong. We have a lot of corporate farmers now. It's growing in that list. Um, and so it's, it's uh, in fact, we had a conversation yesterday in planning whether, it, and it was evolving around the marijuana uh, grow up, or not grow ups, the growing that the federal uh, government has allowing in. Is it manufacturing or is it agriculture? And, and people don't realize agriculture is an industry. Um, the other one I wanted to bring forward to, and I think I'm going to ask Neil to respond in this, the City of Hamilton sector strengths. And we've got a list of companies here. And this is on page 11, top of the page. We have a list of companies here that have either expanded or have come into Hamilton. I think we also have some news from Janko Steel that just came in a couple of days ago that they're also expanding. So I think this is something that will add to that list as well. Yeah? It was page 20 is the, is the list I of uh, manufacturing investment. Councillor, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear the last part of your question. Councillor Johnson, can you go through the chair firstly? Secondly, can you repeat the question? We've got a list of, um, on page 11 in yes. our handout, we've got a list of companies that are either expanding or coming into Hamilton Fresh. And one of the announcements we just heard from a business we gave a recognition award to uh, last month has also something to add to this, plus, probably for the next time we see a list of this come out, a revised list. So do you want to... Uh, expand on that. Okay, uh, Neil, through you, Mr. Deputy, uh, yes, we're aware of that and working with the company presently, but we'll leave it up to them to, uh, to make the announcement. Okay, thank you. It's going to be a good one. Um, and also, the next one, City of Hamilton Sector Strengths, again, coming down to, I know you've put it under food processing and manufacturing, but again, this is an opportunity to highlight agriculture in all the, the city. Um, and one of the things I always ask about, especially at, at um, tax time, when we're looking at comparing ourselves to other uh, sectors, in your list here, and it's the City of Hamilton Market Challenges and Vulnerabilities, and it's the Municipal Property Tax, I don't see on here anywhere uh, with the Haldeman County, Norfolk, because this is some of the ones that both Councillor Ferguson and I both have butt on to. So it's really interesting, interesting because they're, they're expanding as well out in their area. So it would be interesting to find out what they're charging for the for property tax. And the next one where it says market... Okay, uh, Councillor Johnson, is that a question? No, I'd just like to know if, if we can put that in, sorry, for the next uh, slide, if you don't mind. And also the next one, same, same thread, City of Hamilton Marketing Challenges and Vulnerabilities. Um, I don't see anywhere on there St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, uh, Haldeman. So if you don't mind, we'd, I'd like to see that for myself because those are the, the two municipalities that I'm very close, our, our uh, companies are very close to. They're only a half an hour to 40 minutes down the road. I've got St. Catharines up there. No, it's the next slide. Um, anyway, so that's wonderful. When you were looking at, the, can you go to the next slide for me? Yep. Thank you. When you were talking about this, you said that our vacancy rate is at 2.8. Could you please, ex you also said something about, but it's not up in the 6-7 where it should. Can you just expand sure, on that? Sure, sure. So industrial markets, so industrial real estate. In this case, this is the private sector industrial product coming to market where, in this case, it's the brokerage firms, either CBRE or, or Cushman Wakefield, who would report that about the available space in the Hamilton private market space, it's 2.8% at the end of last year. A healthy market would be somewhere in the 6 to 7 percent. The healthy market represents enough product available for tenants so that tenants have a choice when they come to the market. So it's a good balance between landlord and tenants' markets. Okay, so... Now, just on that point, Neil, did you want to interject here for a moment? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I just want to uh, um, inform the Councillor that we have an agricultural uh, profile report. It's in draft. that will be coming very shortly and answer many of the issues you had. Perfect. Thank you. So through you, Deputy Mayor, so what you're saying is the 2.8% is not just empty buildings. We're talking land available, that kind of thing? This is just space, so it's buildings. It's space available, not, not vacant land. Vacant land would be another metric altogether. So it's almost, it's almost like, a, to me, it's like we should have some empty buildings to allow... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So which is why the, the gentleman we just heard from in terms of the new industrial product bringing to market, that's great. And you want to have a lot more of that. And you like to attract as much industrial investment that you can to this marketplace. Because, of course, as you build the product, they will come and you'll create a whole cycle of energy, which is very important. Okay, thank you. And those are my questions, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Johnson. And then we have Councillor, just to get the list in, uh, in order, Councillor McCaddy, Collins, Whitehead, Duvall, and Ferguson. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Sheila, for your presentation. Uh, and I had a chance to, uh, to see it at the economic uh, summit that we had as well. So thanks for coming again to uh, speak directly to Council. This is incredibly important work. Uh, advanced manufacturing is a key part of our future uh, in Hamilton here. So I just wanted to make sure I understood the recommendations. Uh, I guess it was uh, towards the end of your slides. Uh, I'm not sure which one that is, but um, I guess under, uh, maybe it was under market challenges and vulnerabilities and um, and it spoke about the city image and positioning needs to change. That was what you heard from uh, some of the leaders across Hamilton's manufacturing community. And is that, in saying that, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is it sort of that we need to change? Because uh, we've got a long history, as you began your discussion about with your your own family, of manufacturing in Hamilton. It, it tended to be heavy, heavy manufacturing. I don't know if that's the, the term that was used in, in this context versus advanced manufacturing, but is that what you're saying, uh, or what they are saying, uh, that we're having some difficulty, at least from an image perspective, uh, perspective, transitioning from the heavy manufacturing thing that Hamilton always was to being known as, as an advanced manufacturing. We're still sort of lumbering, ponderous a little bit with these big steel mills and that kind of stuff. We, we're not nimble and attractive and with shiny new buildings with advanced manufacturing, you might just try to understand that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Sure. So the conversation for me would come from many places, both from the interviews that the team did with your local people and then with the investment markets and the large site selectors that we deal with business. So we put it all together and said, you know what, branding and image are important. Brand is everything these days, no matter where you go, whether you're Nike or you're Hamilton. You need to really worry about your brand. And so I think there's a couple of opportunities. One, to, you know, of course you benefit substantially from the traditional manufacturing, that's an important foundation, but to move much further beyond in the advanced manufacturing world and position your branding around that. So in all of your marketing materials, your delivery, your opportunities should always be around the future innovation, you know, all the wonderful opportunities that Hamilton has to offer. With respect to the uh, waterfront, when you come across the Skyway Bridge and you see that, I think we also need to consider another uh, strategy and opportunity to enhance that, that visual image, uh, you know, be it a windmill to say that, you know, we've signified something different or whatever it is that you want to come up with, but something that says Hamilton is different today than you've known it for the past 20 or 40 years. I think that's a tremendous opportunity because by repositioning and, you know, brushing it up, you will attract the investment that you'd like to have happen here. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, and the way to do that is, is through, uh, through the branding you, you mentioned, I guess, mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, our staff have picked up that in that in their, in their report here, so they'll work on that. Um, just I, I always uh, wonder a little bit when, when it's, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, when the focus is on the high municipal property taxes, because you know we also have quite high residential uh, taxes as well, given the shift that's occurred uh, back in the good old days, uh, the industrial uh, tax assessment was much higher, residential was lower, and now it's split the other way around. It's uh, 65, 35, or somewhere 70, 30 in that range, and residential's paying a high percentage of the, the tax here. So that's our challenge here in Hamilton. Uh, overall rather than just the industrial analysis and you, earlier you mentioned that our DCs are still fairly low and I think our land values are still low compared to some of our comparators so and in quality of life and there's other things going on in Hamilton so what do you, would you say from a triple bottom line analysis of that uh, 
despite the fact that our, our property taxes, industrial property taxes, are higher than some of the comparators, uh, if you put together a number of uh, analytics, we're still fairly positive when it comes to uh, attracting uh, advanced manufacturing. I, I just wonder sometimes when we focus uh, more just on the, the property taxes. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay. Um, so I'll explain to you the way a real estate investor would look at that topic. So I think overall there's a bundle of wonderful things happening in Hamilton. So for new business coming here, I think there's certainly a tremendous story. For a real estate developer, if you want to track one of the large real estate developers to Hamilton and you wanted to say, come and build a giant industrial park and take on the financial risk, use your pension fund dollars, make this happen. For them to do that, they have to have, you know, the, the math always needs to work. And in order for the math to work, their uh, development opportunity has to equal the rent that they can generate from that, from that property. So that math needs to work. From the user, they're going to say, there's only so much I'm prepared to pay for that particular asset. If I can get a lower quality or you know, a lower cost asset somewhere else. And so you're always looking at the math in that world. So it's interesting that today many municipalities are having to peel away those layers to figure out exactly what that looks like so they know what the sweet spot is for the tax charge and how that can work. Mr. Deputy Mayor, again, just so when, they, when the real estate investors look at that, do they just look at property taxes or do they look at the cost of land and the cost of DCs as well? They look at the all-in price. They look at how much is it going to cost them to build that. So it's the DCs, it's land, it's everything all in, and then how much will the user have to pay for rent in order to get there? Right. So it's so that balance. Putting, putting those together, is, is Hamilton that much higher than, than our comparators then because of the property tax? So right now your gross rent would not be higher, but you're not seeing a, a, you know abundance of new industrial development here. So I think that points to an issue that you need to peel away some of those layers to say what is the issue and how can we solve for it versus a Mississauga, a Brampton, a Vaughan that is building the stuff like crazy. Yeah. So I'm still struggling with that because I know the, the cost of land is much higher in Brampton or, or some of the other places. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I guess I'd have to actually sit down with the real estate investors and, and understand that directly from them. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not, you know, as you know, we've we've had difficult time in our my ten years here, uh, for example, reducing those industrial taxes. So I'm still not sure what the uh, the answer is on our end. So we're happy to help. We do those all the time, and it's a literally a feasibility and an analytical piece on that, so it's very possible to do. Okay. Thanks very much, Sheila. Thank you, uh, Councillor McCaddy. We now have Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Sheila. Sheila, the, um, you, you mentioned, uh, you referenced the GTA area a lot, and you raised um, several times in your presentation certainly the benefits that Hamilton has with its historical um, industrial area our brownfield properties, and you were here earlier today to listen to um, one of our success stories in terms of remediating one of those properties with a private investor and turning an underlized uh, um, vacant parcel of land into a, now a, a tax and job producing property. But we're in, a, in sort of a fork in the road in terms of our development plans, and for as much as we've tried to remediate and uh, revitalize all of that uh, Bayfront uh, industrial skyline that you referenced and you had some good pictures there to represent that. We know that not everyone coming to town, um, the pension fund investors, the realtors, not all of them are seeking to take a chance on a brownfield property. So we've been forced to certainly create new opportunities for people with our new industrial parks. And I'm wondering um, from a marketing perspective, and from the, what the industry is looking for right now, um, we had a, a very long meeting yesterday to talk about the investment of a new industrial park around our airport. And I'm wondering how something like that um, would help or hinder the city in terms of its ability to compete with other municipalities, whether it's the GTA or elsewhere. So I think we're proposing, it was a thousand hectares of new industrial land. And there's the debate locally whether we should put our eggs in the Bayfront Industrial Park and try to, to maximize their return and we're trying as best we can. We have a greater raise program. But there's also the, the, the thought process that that may not be the product that most investors are looking for and so we need to be prepared for um, the alternative which is new industrial parks on greenfields. And so can I get your, your take on that issue? So new industrial parks, greenfield parks are always wonderful. The development community will 
be very keen to become engaged in that process, especially if the space users want to be in that market. And that's a certain user type, a certain investment type profile. Pension fund investment, big money, will go after typically that kind of a scenario. When you enter into the brownfield world, it's a different world. And so you'd have an investment, a different investment profile, pension funds, maybe not. Private investors, possibly. Certain uh, U.S. vulture funds, absolutely. They've come to Canada to, to look at that product. Then you say from the, that's the development side of it. Um, then you look at the users, and the users might be very different in each one of the locations. So I think you need a two-pronged approach is the bottom line to that. Because, of course, you can't ignore the Bayfront. It's very important for Hamilton overall. But having new greenfield sites for greater opportunities in the long term, certainly down the 403 corridor, are really important. That's great. I really appreciate that information. Uh, I do have another question on the Bayfront, and that is we're, we'll be undertaking a secondary planning process for the Bayfront to determine what it will look like over the next 20 or 30 years. And for as much as we've seen some new investments and the reuse of some of those properties, traditionally what we've seen over the last number of years is bulk storage outside, recycling plants, those types of operations that certainly um, they, they pay t municipal taxes, they are definitely making use of those properties, but we're not seeing the advanced manufacturing, if you want to call it that, that others are seeing. And there's not a lot of jobs, to be honest, that comes with you know, um, bulk storage or recycling or any of those. So the, I think if you were to start to look at the jobs per acre or hectare, probably a lot lower than what you'd see in some of the communities that you referenced earlier that we're competing against. In terms of um, our ability then to in attract new investment in those areas, what would you suggest for properties that have those challenges? There are remediation issues. Certainly one of the benefits one could advertise is that the, the zoning is the K zoning, which almost allows anything, um, is certainly beneficial compared to some other communities who have been very reluctant to take on those operations. Your, your thoughts on, on, on the Bayfront property and, and where others have taken it in other communities where they've been successful? Or have some just left it to chance and hope that someone's going to take a chance on those properties and they'll make, a, they'll make it work one way or the other? So leaving anything to chance, I don't think is a strategy. So my, my suggestion would be to actually tackle a strategy, do a comprehensive strategy for the entire Bayfront in Hamilton. The best example is down the road with Waterfront Corporation and John Campbell. You know, they've spent, what, 15 years now of John's life trying to figure out what to do for the Toronto Waterfront. Well, look where they are today compared to when they started. So if you took that same energy and approach starting with a strategy for the Hamilton Bayfront, it'll become an incredible, it is an incredible asset. So the opportunities to develop the asset, to attract the users and the investment that you would like there for the long-term sustainability of Hamilton. That's great. My last question would be through you, Mr. Chairman, Sheila. I think we've all watched with great interest as municipal leaders some of the um, issues that the manufacturing sector is experiencing across the province and certainly across Canada. And we've all watched the Bix announcements and the Heinz announcements and the major closure, closure of, you know, in some communities it's the only game in town. And, and, and we're not seeing, at least I haven't seen, other than maybe the investments made in the auto industry, which we've been certainly a beneficiary of, we haven't seen investments in advanced manufacturing from other levels of government. And so, other than the auto industry bailouts there from the province and the feds, there hasn't been a lot of strategies, so to speak, or investments made to get us, to, to take us from the water buffalo to the gazelle. And, um, and I'm wondering what you've encouraged other municipalities to do when we're meeting with our federal and provincial partners. What are industry analysts um, encouraging municipalities to do? And what are you doing as an industry analyst to, I mean, you're... You're speaking to our provincial and federal counterparts. What are you encouraging them to do in terms of manufacturing and, and to get us back on track to where we maybe were? And maybe it's unrealistic to think we'll get back to the pre-NAFTA day numbers um, in terms of employment numbers and, um, and GDP, but Ontario is quickly becoming a, a check writer instead of, uh, or we're becoming a recipient rather than a writer when we look at equalization payments and everything else. So we're falling behind and and many are looking for the plan, and I don't know if there's a bumper sticker solution to it, but you, you certainly know a lot about it, and I'd like to know your insight on that. So I would say a couple of things. One, Hamilton needs its own plan. 
So you need to look at the big world out there and say, what's going on with all of these different players? What is our plan? What are we going to do? What can we do to affect change within our community? And there's a shopping list of things that you can do locally. So that's really positive. In terms of the province itself, I've been very encouraged by the people that I've met in the industrial front and the manufacturing front with respect to what they're starting to do. So I'm very encouraged by that. I think there's, of course, there's a lot that they can be doing. We're involved in a number of strategies with them from the site selection, making global sites available, competitive sites. So I think it's positive, it's gaining momentum in that area. The sad world of site selection is, you know, the, the, the incentives that are provided to users, be it in the southern U.S., Mexico, you know, and certainly for some of the work we've done recently between provinces here in Canada. And so that's pretty much a, what you have to do to retain or attract that business, and that's a fact of life. We can't say it's not going to happen. It is very much a fact of life for those large corporations. Then you say within Hamilton, what can we do to affect that change? What is our strategy and how can we take advantage of the provincial initiatives, the federal initiatives, and then within our own local geography? I think it's very important. It's almost like we need a by-election to get an investment here. <laughs> it unfortunately seems to be government announcements follow elections and by-elections. So anyway, though, I really appreciate your presentation. Yeah. It's um, terrific information. Yeah. We actually need it more than once a year. Yeah, it would be great to have Anytime. you back uh, almost on a monthly basis and uh, to keep us on our toes because I, for as much as I look at all the opportunities, I think your recommendations to deal with our challenges are, are, are more important to focus on. And, and um, anyway, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. We now have Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the presentation. One of the things I'm hearing from, um, um, and I've met with a number of uh, in, uh, Siemens and a number of organizations that have had investment, moved investment out of Hamilton and so forth. Uh, one of the key things I, you know, I might have missed it, so I'm, I'm going to ask, was uh, uh, global supply chains is one of those realities they, uh, that influences uh, where companies go. Transportation is one of those things that uh, uh, they look where to go. And uh, I know when I was on uh, FCM, one of the things we talked about is whether uh, there's a, unorganized chaos. We, we're, uh, because we know metropolitans are, are economies are uh, been uh, um, developing metro, uh, through metropolitan areas. So, for example, Burlington and Hamilton might be a, uh, a larger metropolitan area, and whether we should be pursuing uh, something that's called sectorial uh, development. So focus on what our strengths are, focus on, on uh, what we have, the skill sets, and, uh, and really go after the, 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 the companies that make most sense in that context. So I, I just bounce that off you and, and just looking for some comments. The answer is yes, absolutely. I'm trying to get to my... Some reason it won't do it. There you go. Um, clusters. That's what we call it in economic development strategy clusters and creating really valid, viable clusters, building on the strength that you have right now. So we've identified some of the clusters that you already have. There's some others that you could you could potentially add to that. So the whole big book there has a conversation about each of the clusters in Hamilton and what you can do to both attract and retain new business and investment to those clusters. Really important. With respect to the supply chain, it always goes back to the math with any decision. And supply chain is about math. And so if you are a global supply chain player, you're looking at where you're going to be um, within North America, within the world, to keep your costs low and to deliver you know, quality goods and services back to your, your clients. So it's all about the math. And so each company is different. I've worked here with a number of the Hamilton Industries on their supply chain issues. And for some of them, it's great here. And others say, you know what, it's more um, valuable to be elsewhere. I appreciate that. And when you talk about clusters, I guess a good example, and you identified is uh, uh, what's happening with the food uh, processing uh, uh, is becoming a, a fairly solid uh, cluster that we can uh, continue to expand on. So that's certainly a, an opportunity that uh, prevails itself on the city of Hamilton. Um, is there any other type of clusters or sec uh, sectors that you feel, uh, if you were to target uh, in regards to our strengths, what, they, what would they be? Certainly the traditional industries we spoke to, and we've spoken about uh, food services. We've also talked about the life sciences slash biotech industry and the renewable energy industry. There are some opportunities there. And then there's sub-themes within each one of those. Which segment do you actually chase after, and where is the opportunity, the low-hanging fruit? 
Now, um, we have, a little, uh, not a lot of people know this, but we have um, um, a fairly significant regulatory, uh, uh, ph pharmaceutical regulatory uh, organization. I think it's up in, uh, in Flamborough. Um, but I, we haven't really attracted a lot of pharmaceutical uh, um, interest in the city of Hamilton. And, I'm, and you know, when you take a look at um, the back to the, su the supply chain and the opportunities in regards to uh, the globalization of pharmaceuticals, um, do you see uh, any merit in, 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 um, in, in the regulatory group that basically does all, a lot of testing and, and, and runs it through all the regulatory bodies to get the approvals? One of the major organizations is located right here in the city of Hamilton. Do um, you think, feel that we can leverage a uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, cluster in the city of Hamilton? So I think you can absolutely develop a biotech slash pharmaceutical slash life sciences cluster and enhance that that you already have today. So of course, McMaster and all the hospitals here, it's, it represents a viable opportunity. So that then in our report, we've talked about a very carefully developed strategy toward making that happen much further. I appreciate Very that. Very competitive world in that world. We're working on a number of those uh, site selection opportunities right now and is as much about um, kind of provincial intervention as it is the local municipality. <laughs> And uh, th that's a very interesting uh, point that you just identified. Because um, when I worked at the, uh, the provincial government, uh, and I think it carried on beyond, is that they actually had a committee that strategically looked at uh, investment in Ontario. And they would actually hand bags of, uh, of money as an enticement to have uh, uh, businesses locate in the areas they've identified. So what, uh, how significant role uh, is your understanding in regards to the provincial intervention in regards to uh, attracting business into uh, geographic areas? Um, you know, I'm certainly not aware of anything of that nature within Ontario, but I think there's um, certainly an opportunity for Hamilton to wave the flag a lot more and say, you know, we'd like to take advantage of some of these opportunities. Certainly the infrastructure here, the proximity, Toronto, all of those things are wonderful attributes to, to benefit from. Appreciate it. Well, the example I would use is the, uh, the whole uh, uh, environmental industry. Mm -hmm. uh, initiated by the province of Ontario, and they uh, provided significant dollars for for those types of investments. Um, my understanding is they they uh, clearly had a role in where a lot of those uh, industries uh, located. And so that's my point about how do we uh, align ourselves with the provincial province to ensure that we're optimizing um, um, the geographic investments in the city of Hamilton versus uh, what is actually t currently taking place. So there's a strategy around that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. We have now Councillor Duvall. Thanks, and thanks very much for your presentation. Appreciate it. When I was uh, listening and reading at the same time, I kind of thought maybe Tim Hudak was responsible for some of this stuff for saying about the union movement being uh, some of the problems and, and uh, for manufacturing here. But well, you could take your your study and you could put that to every municipality across Canada. It wouldn't be just Hamilton. Canada has a manufacturing problem countrywide. And it's because our federal government um, is allowing foreign investment to come in here, the big conglomerates, and the big fish are eating up the small fish. They're getting rid of their competition. And until that stops, we don't know what we're supposed to manufacture and what the actual resources we have. I mean, we're being raped on our resources. Manu uh, if you look at the steel industry in Canada, um, we don't own one. We, do we don't have a Canadian steel industry. It's all foreign done. And so we have other countries that have been um, gone through bad economic times, and then what they've done is they've taken in um, uh, giving monies to boost up their, their companies, and then they buy ours, and U.S. Steel is a good example. Um, so the competition, they got rid of it. So they made American jobs. So everybody's fighting in each different country about where, what they're going to manufacture. So it's very, very difficult. And then still in Ontario, many manufacturing jobs are, are it's not because of the tax base, but what they got. It's because they can't afford the hydro and the resources that it is to manufacture it here. And we're chasing, in Ontario, we are chasing out companies just because of the hydro prices. They can't, they can do it cheaper somewhere else, so they go somewhere else. And 
if you look in the states, they're offering free mortgage payments, free land, they're offering free hydro, they're offering uh, you know, a 10 year break in their taxes. How do you compete? How does Canada compete, or even Hamilton, against those organizations that are offering this? It's a very competitive world out there. You know, it's certainly beyond our Hamilton borders with respect to competition around the world. You know, you could talk about China, India, Africa. You could talk about the U.S. and down into Mexico and South America. It's very competitive out there. So it's recognizing that traditional manufacturing is moving toward advanced manufacturing, as per the presentation, and that in the advanced manufacturing world, it actually is the right time to start making investments in that world and saying, what can we do and how can we create create some opportunities here in Hamilton. I could speak about Westcam, Triveris, and all of those companies that have come out of Hamilton, where in fact they are advanced manufacturing. You say, what can we do to create more of those and give those companies some energy to move forward, create the gazelles to become part of our future? in addition to dealing with the traditional manufacturing world, because it is a reality, of course, but you need to take a two-prong approach. So it goes back to the recommendation of an overall strategy for Hamilton and being very mindful as to what that strategy is within the global shifting environment. Okay, um, but did you feel that uh, a lot of companies are going for the um, bottom line and there's greed out there? So a lot of companies, if you, if you remember, went down to Mexico um, because our environmental laws were very tough and our health and safety laws are very tough. And that was to support the working people. But they went down there so they could ruin the environment, have cheap labor, no safety rules, no nothing. And then they end up coming back because they find out that they didn't have the skilled workforce. And our problem that we're facing now, and even in Hamilton, with some of the industry that is left, we don't know what to train for because we don't know what the government is going to allow to be taken out next. And until the feds and the province um, start working together and then the Canada Investment Act, we, this country, right across, not just Hamilton, right across, because everywhere I go, it's all these companies are leaving. And it's not because, um, you know, we have a, a little bit of a higher tax base or, or anything like that, as I said before. It is because of big fish eating small fish. And those countries now are getting higher costs. And it's coming back to, to North America, but it's a matter of where we can develop and who, who's got the training skills. I can't believe that uh, every time I hear somebody um, uh, talk about uh, our skills, um, we have an unemployment rate out there that to me is very high. How can we be short of skills? What skills are they looking for? And that's what bothers me. We have people here that have them. I, when, when Stelco closed down um, some of their companies, and they, uh, I'm sorry, when, when they were hiring and some of the other companies were closing down, we asked them to hire them because they had the industrial skills. They didn't want them. They wanted people with grade 12 and university education so they could go on to the future. They, it, it, it's a very mixed up um, process. They, they, what is happening, but to to look at this and say this is Hamilton's manufacturing and advanced manufacturing and, and giving us ideas, this is not Hamilton. You, you could put this whole program and put Burlington, you could put BC, you could put anywhere into it and it's happening here. So uh, those are just my comments, but it's very, very um, discouraging when I see uh, challenges to the union. We're competitive because we have a union base. Everybody has a union base. And, 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 I, and I kind of get tired of that when I'm hearing um, we're, jobs are being costed because of the union. It's, it's the, what the market calls for. Um, it, it, now, on, on that it, point, though, Councillor Duvall, on that point. I'll, I'll just leave it like that. Would you like I, to expand upon that? Because yeah. is that what the implication is with, with reference to that statement? So it's the perception. So as we did our interviews and as we talked to investors, it was the perception that the presence of the union environment was more limiting than, than perhaps not. And so to your point of jobs moving down to Mexico and elsewhere, because they're without 
some of those constraints. And it, it all falls under, I'll say, the, the Ontario Red Tape Report and some of those other elements. It's about the larger structure in terms of um, potentially inhibiting business from achieving what it would like to achieve. So it's an umbrella comment as a perception. And, and just the, the last comment on, on that, I appreciate what you're, you're saying, but in the union environment where I came from, um, unions have always been, I, I, I guess, as you say, the perception is being uh, difficult to deal with. Companies run their business, they have the right to run their business, but when companies fail their business because of mismanagement, they always come to the union for help to how to get out of it. But they never ask for help to how to get into it. Just, just a comment. Thank you. But just for, for a point of clarification, you're not union bashing at all. Oh, the, gosh, no. Okay. I think that's important no. to move. Okay, but... No, I that's think, not... That's, that, no, no. So can what you we just talk elaborate? about specifically yeah. is, it, is it a perception based on the interviews and the information that we've received? By no means is it a comment on our views, our values. I have to say one more thing, if you don't mind. Sure. So that productivity work that you saw, that we have stacks and stacks of reports that Deloitte feels very passionately about this subject as well. And so we've done it independently for governments of Canada, Ontario, the provinces, any municipality, because we also believe it's very, very important. And so we're trying to share as much of that information for everybody to collectively come to the right solution for Canada. Now, on that point, though, how do you reconcile that perception and integrate it into the recommendations? Um, so, to be honest, that particular point has not been integrated into a recommendation. I think it's about branding and marketing. So, I think you say, what are the uh, perceptions and the opportunities with Hamilton now? It's in traditional manufacturing. How do you reposition that to be innovative, advanced manufacturing? What are the opportunities out there? I think that's really where that plays, as opposed to anything specific related to that okay. topic. Are you fine with that, Councillor Gallo? Yeah. All right. So, just to clarify that point. All right. Now, uh, Councillor Whitehead, on this point? Uh, if you take a look at Germany, um, it, which is a highly unionized in, in environment, uh, they actually incorporate uh, 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 unions even on, on boards because they recognize the value of unions. And we know that Germany is one of the uh, stronger economies in Europe. So clearly I understand the perception piece and then there's sort of a reality piece and the question is how do we bridge those two pieces? Would, would that be a correct way of characterizing? Absolutely. You need a carefully developed strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we have now Councillor Ferguson. Thank you. And, and, and first of all, Shai, I understand where that perception comes from. I hear it all the time, too. It's from bygone days, but perceptions stick around until investors can clear that. And that perception of the view from the Skyway is there, too. And I agree with your grandfather. That's prosperity when you take a look. But people who drive from Toronto to Niagara Falls may have a different perception. And perception is a hard thing to neutralize, whether it's because we have militant unions or the view from the Skyway. But, I, um, you know, as responsible leaders, I don't want to focus on your good news because you've got a lot of it in there, and uh, there's a lot of good things happening. We have on congested roads. We have access to a big market, and, and you know, and that's evidenced by our building permits being issued. But I want to focus just in on, on a couple slides where you, you put up some bad news just to, to drill down on that. The first one is the uh, high municipal property taxes. There's no slide numbers on this, so I can't tell yes. you. It's on page 14 um, of, of our CANDO, but just probably double that for the slides. My apologies for that. That was a miss on this document. Sorry. Keep going. I'll find it as we as we speak. There it is. And and. Uh, in my, my perception, to use that word, was that wasn't the facts. And my question more to Mike, Mr. Chairman, to Mike, do you agree with that slide? Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, we wouldn't question the fact that our tax rates are high. Uh, what committee may recall through our tax competitive studies is that staff not only report our tax rates, but we report taxes per square foot. And you may recall in June we had our last tax competitiveness study and we identified that in the two industrial classes, our standard industrial class is the class that we see higher than average taxes per square foot. And you may also recall that when we looked at 2012 to 2001, 
is our large industrial class has actually seen a decrease in taxes per square foot at 25%. The standard industrial has been volatile for two reasons. Reassessments have had an impact on the city of Hamilton. So our standard industrial class has seen a higher than average impact from reassessment, which could be a measure of success for the property owners in that their assessed value is increasing at a higher pace. In fact, Sheila identified that it's a tight real estate market for, for industrial, and that would suggest the reassessment, the increase in reassessment values would confirm that. The other challenge with standard industrial is Hamilton's had a tax rate which was at the provincial ceiling, uh, uh, education tax rate. The province brought in a targeted program to reduce business education taxes, which benefited a number of our sample comparators. So while education tax rates did not change for the city of Hamilton, for our 17 comparators, their education tax rates declined by 7% to 12%. So two factors, reassessment and business education tax rates have caused our standard industrial tax rate per square foot to go from a 1% above average to about 12%. Okay. I guess, um, you know, my, during my first term on council, we had a policy where the industrial tax rate, commercial industrial tax rate, went up 50% of the residential tax increases, which shifted more of a burden over the residential side. And, and so I'm surprised and I see that slide. And it's, it, are you suggesting maybe that slide may not be correct in consideration of the significant reassessments that have been done? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, as a tax rate, it's correct. But what we try to provide for council's information is not only do we provide the information in terms of tax rates, we apply the tax rates to assess value. I think Councillor McCaddy mentioned the fact that there's other factors such as land value, assessed value, and development charges. So when we provide the information to council, we include the information in terms of taxes per square foot to try to capture the assessed value impact in terms of our competitiveness. So again, going back, the Escalation in the assessed value in the city of Hamilton Industrial has outpaced other municipalities and the business education tax relief that the province has introduced has benefited some of the comparator municipalities, uh, which cre is creating that gap between the city of Hamilton and our comparators in terms of the standard industrial class. I guess, you know, during the whole budget presentation, we hear it all the time, taxes are too high in Hamilton. And and, and with the slides I keep keep seeing going up there, we're in the middle of the pack, yeah. maybe even below, slightly below the average. And, uh, you know, the reason that um, uh, we may come out and where we score poorly is as a percentage of income, we're near the highest. Uh, it worries me that Sheila, with all of her qualifications, is going to be a speaker at all of the pension fund conferences and all the other investor conferences, and she puts that slide up, we're going to look like dopes. And, and, and it worries me that you, we need to know about this and, 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 and that we haven't got this under control. So I need something to come back to me to show what's happened to the education tax. You know, where do we benchmark with other major providers? Uh, because I have trouble believing that when we have more building permits issued than Toronto or Mississauga or Brampton or Burlington. It, it seems to fly in the face of the reality of what's really happening out there. But this is what the investors are going to see, is that slide right there. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't know how to ask for, you know, don't always, don't, don't I guess maybe the, is a message that we're, we're getting the rosy stuff, because I, and I know we always press for residential, because that's the one that's most important to us. But we don't see that one enough to understand it. Um, and I'm surprised that, because we did have a focus there to have a 50% increase on commercial industrial versus residential, and yet we're still not scoring well. So, so through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we will be reporting in terms of our tax competitiveness I suspect in the early summer is uh, in, in terms of this standard industrial, again, uh, it has been vol volatile. When we looked at our 
our uh, comparator sample in, in 2006, the difference uh, between 2006 and 2009, Hamilton was between 1 to 3 percent greater than the average. Since 2010, we we're now at about 27 percent above the average. And it's those two factors I mentioned previously, okay. the impacts from reassessment and the targeted reduction in business education tax rates. Okay, that so you, you, you'll be bringing our, something back to us that'll illustrate yeah. that that we can get our head around? Yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, we'll update the report and bring that forward, I suspect, sometime in June. Okay, thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Then I'm going to ask you some questions, Sheila. The next one after this? Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, I saw that slide on the left as good news, that you know, people are, in fact, coming to Hamilton and, you know, we always are hearing about we got to focus on redeveloping brownfields. But that, does that tell me that these brownfield buildings are, are full and, in full and and operating at capacity if we only have 2 or 1% vacancy? Is, is that how I should interpret that? This is an average. So this is an average across Hamilton for the private sector buildings that are in the market. So it wouldn't represent the big owned properties like Arcelor or U.S. Steel. This represents the private sector buildings that would be owned. They would report into the brokerage firms what their vacancy is. I want to lease space. I want to lease space. Here's what I've got. And that average comes out to 2.8% on the private sector part of the market. But when all those properties, and I assume you're from Hamilton, you've probably driven around our industrial areas. You know, the Victoria, the Wentworth, the Burlington, mm -hmm. the, you know, Park, Arsenal, Mitchell, Park, U.S. Steel, because I understand that's private ownership and, and also publicly, uh, publicly traded, uh, but private ownership. But that would tell me that what looks like brownfields maybe isn't brownfields in the rest of the city if we're down to, you know, 1% to 2%. So this is the private sector market, which tells you you don't have enough product in that private sector market to deal with the demand that you have. And so there's an investment opportunity for pension funds, other investors to build new products, such as your Brownfield example earlier. Um, so there's, there is an opportunity in the market. You obviously have to do a full feasibility study on which site, which project, what does it look like, but there is an opportunity in the market. You would like to have a higher vacancy rate than that for your tenants and to attract new business to Hamilton. I understand that part. But I try to interpret, do we really have a real serious brownfield problem? And you, you keep referencing, this is private sector availability. Yeah. That's all there is down there is private sector. So, so no, no, but for the, for the commercial real estate market. So on the owned market, which is probably what your brownfield sites are all about, it's probably large corporations that own their own assets, and therefore those buildings are not part of this inventory because their owned assets are not part of the for lease market. This is just the for lease market. Right, so Arcelor wouldn't be in this inventory because it's not available for a lease by a private sector developer. Uh, okay. Which means it's in full use. It's being which used means it's in full for use. the purpose intended. Yep. So I guess the, your answer is no. That doesn't signal to me that maybe we don't have a large brownfield problem. So again, I haven't personally looked at the brownfield problem, so I don't know each user of each of those buildings to understand if they believe they're staying in the building, leaving the building, what does that look like as a market? I don't know the answer to that. Oh, so if the building's sitting empty but it's not on the marketplace, you wouldn't know about it? You wouldn't know. It wouldn't be in this stat. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Council Ferguson. We have uh, Mayor, Mayor Bertino. Thank you. As opposed to the other mayor. <laughs> okay. Other former mayor. All right. I was introduced, by the way, at, uh, at a church on Sunday is, and now we're pleased to have Mayor Bob Morrill. <laughs> <laughs> Looked around. <laughs> anyway, um, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, Sheila, one of the most important things in the entire report is in the very beginning, and it's the definition, and I think it's important for the people around this table to understand the definition. Advanced manufacturing is best viewed as a cluster of economic activities encompassing more than manufacturing enterprise alone. It encompasses all facets, research, development, and so on. That's critical because ArcelorMittal de Fasco is an advanced manufacturing Corp entity. They're making more steel now than when I worked there 50 years ago with 10,000 less employees. So would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Right. So the uh, it's interesting because um, I'm like your grandfather and uh, I when I see our industrial skyline I, it, it motivates me and it inspires me. 
We have a company called Birmingham who are 115 years old. They make docks and underwater pilings and so on. They just expanded uh, down at the end of Ferguson Avenue. Uh, Birmingham said the company is able to take advantage of nearby manufacturers for its steel and heavy rolling, keeping transportation costs and delays down. You would have to go a very long way to find a collection of companies that rival what can be found in Hamilton. When you're in heavy steel fabrication, this is where to be in, Cam in uh, Canada. And um, they're in their... Uh, uh, employee count is at 175, and they expect that to double. A uh, French company has uh, taken part in, uh, uh, um, has purchased a part of the a stake in Birmingham, and they uh, have a contract for so many things, including a Second World War museum in Warsaw with underwater pilings and a massive iron ore mining project on Baffin Island. They found iron ore on Baffin Island. Birmingham is uh, going to do the dockage. This is an advanced manufacturing company, right? Absolutely. Okay. So that's neat. we need to understand that. And, and, and people lament, well, those smokestacks, and it wouldn't be nice if it was Disneyland. Well, when you compare the wages at Disneyland with what they're making at Arcelor, it's a lot better in the steel mill. So I, I think we, we need to understand that as we envision the, the future of our city. But uh, let me go on to the very important uh, comment also. It's all important. It's an excellent report. Middle class consumer base. Uh, we, one of our assets is that with our 6% unemployment and the median couple's income of $86,000 per family, Companies like to move into settings like that, wouldn't you say? Rather than some depressed uh, outback place? Absolutely. And so, so many of the things that we have in place, and I think that's part of uh, what you're talking about, uh, we just have to get out and market that. Is that fair to say? So having a strategy to understand which markets you want to be in, which clusters you'd like to be in, what opportunities you'd like to take advantage of, and develop a comprehensive marketing and branding strategy. Very important. So attending all of the core net functions, which is corporate real estate in North America and in the world, MIPM over in Europe, all of those things are very important to be a player in that game to attract the opportunity. Well, I could go on, but I, I appreciate the report, and especially we all have to be under, understanding of what advanced manufacturing is. It's a whole range, a continuum of things, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for ending on that. I started on that, and thank you for ending. That's very important. Okay, we have uh, next on the list, uh, Councillor Pearson, and then Morrow. Councillor uh, Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Mr. Chairman, and to the excellent presentation. You know how I get the sense this was excellent and we've all been listening so attentively because it's been absolutely quiet in here. And I'm really pleased to see that because we all know what we need to move forward on as far as moving Hamilton ahead is, you know, we've got the billion dollars in building permits and that's great news, but we need to get that polish mm -hmm. on our industrial. I think that's basically how we need to look at that. I also just wanted to mention, I mean, I know Neil and Norm are both here and I know they do a phenomenal job of getting out in the communities. They've done a tremendous amount of work in Stony Creek. I know that in drawing uh, industry into the areas and doing their best and, you know, branding and getting that information out there. So kudos to them. I know they've been trying very hard. Um, I guess, uh, you know, the, the, the issue has been, and you mentioned the gazelle and the water buffalo, and I'm sitting here and thinking of industries that I've lost in my ward. And, um, you know, it kind of relates in the picture here of, you know, an industry where I had a, a phenomenal, it was a recycling industry for uh, technology, computers, etc. And uh, there were incent incentives, there were assistance with regards to programs through the pr province um, that they had over a number of years. They had expansions coming, I had a further expansion they were working on, and all of a sudden that plug was pulled, and they're gone. So can you address that as maybe is this not one of the issues that we seem to have to deal with, we don't have control over as a municipality? So I think there will always be a shifting landscape no matter what you do. I think there will always be changes from global forces, there will always be government issues, intervention, opportunities, that will always be there. That's almost you know, fact of life, status quo. Within that, what do you do for your strategy? And what makes sense and what's logical for Hamilton to take advantage of the existing clusters to build on those and then to add new clusters to take advantage of some of the new programs and new opportunities. So you need a strategy, I guess is the big message for today, with math attached to it. 
Kathy, and we can't financially give strategies because that's illegal. That's right. But uh, there should be some other ways. I mean, some ways that we could look at, and staff hopefully will be coming forward something and saying, how do we look at this and being able to keep them? And then, as you mentioned through here, is, you know, the tax base, et cetera. But how do we keep them here? Because once they're here, you know, I think they all the intent is that they want to move forward. They want to keep. They want to keep being the gazelle out there and, and innovations, et cetera. This particular industry was a perfect example. Um, so I really appreciate that information. And, and two, I agree with the, the view of the Skyway. I mean, I look at that. That's, that's the heart of the city, and that's put a lot of people in homes and, and uh, families' uh, mouths in their food in their mouths and, and education to their, to their youngsters. So um, we have to keep that, that vision going and, and support enhancing it there. Um, the other part, and really what I wanted to touch on, what really got me, is the presentation, the slide you had with regards to development charges. And uh, we will be starting up our development charge review in, in uh, March um, through that cycle again. And you, you say that it's really, really important to keep our development charges down. But looking at the graph that you've provided with that, I mean, we're really at the bottom end of the chart as it is now. I mean, I think we had no development charges on industry when I first started on that uh, committee several terms ago. And then I think we went up to a dollar square foot. I mean, we've been very reasonable in that. So I'm, I'm really kind of questioning, you've got, you're showing the bonds and the new markets, and they're well above, you know, better than double R's. And uh, how is that happening? Okay. That's a good loaded question. So some of the GTA municipalities are making substantive investments in infrastructure, subway extensions, other things like that. So they use the development charges to recapture some of that initial investment. They will probably be challenged through that. Um, there's a philosophy in terms of, you know, making the current generations pay for lack of investment for the past generations. And so within Toronto, you've seen a lot of uh, profile and media around that exact topic. So I don't know that these higher development charges are something to necessarily aspire to. Obviously, you're going to look at a competitive market for Hamilton with respect to development charges. Probably the reason this is so low is because your taxes are higher. So you have to look at the entire financial equation. You look at all of the math to understand what is the right number, where do you land on the Hamilton opportunity. Person. Yeah, thank you. So I really appreciate that. And I guess what you're saying then that, I mean, we see the higher packages that are coming from other communities, but they're going to end up probably in a bind faster than we are uh, moving forward because we now have that growth potential and um, infrastructure uh, improvements and, and upgrades that are coming in, in concert with that, correct? So they would have some of the infrastructure, subway extensions, you know, the whole, um, you know, uh, smart growth and, and uh, you know, the, the whole go transit system. Here in Hamilton, you'll also have those infrastructures, but I don't know that the costs are as high here locally. So I think you've got a great platform to start from. Where that number lands is part of the overall equation. I'll be sure to carry that forward to the subcommittee, Mr. Jeffy Mayor. Thank you, Sheila. Appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor uh, Pearson. We have Councillor Morrill. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, we can get back to taxes for a moment. Last week there was mention uh, of uh, differential between our uh, money uh, situation and Windsor's. And I'm not sure if that fit into any of the things we talked about today, educational uh, development charges or whatever, or if it was a, a totally different issue. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in terms of uh, Windsor's change in uh, tax rate, uh, it is a bit of a different issue. Uh, in terms of tax competitiveness, uh, we look at the change in tax rates and tax burden over time. Uh, I believe what the Councillor is referring to is the fact that Windsor has been able to hold the line in terms of tax increases over the uh, past number of years as a relate in part from increased transfer payments from the province as well as some changes in their delivery of services uh, in the city of Windsor. But to uh, the Councillor's point in terms of uh, our discussion earlier last week, we were focusing on the annual change in rates uh, over the last few years rather than uh, the change in tax burden over the past decade, which is what we focus on in terms of our tax competitiveness. I don't, I don't want to raise points that perhaps are being avidly 
addressed already uh, and that I could ask privately, but I'm just wondering if we shouldn't emphasize more a strategy uh, on taxes that involves some of these other issues. I think it's uh, been the case that we've sometimes been behind the eight ball uh, systemically because of what the province does and how they treat here. different <laughs> municipalities. And uh, over the years, we can look at, at various uh, governments in power who we had representing us, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as perhaps uh, playing a role. Uh, uh, so we've got to have strong voices making sure that we get uh, treated properly. And so I'm wondering if that, plus the educational side, plus anything else that that impinges in addition to the uh, very fine work that this council has done and previous councils on the uh, tax rate and controlling uh, our own budgets here at this table. Um, and I'm wondering if we couldn't ponder a, 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 a heftier push in favor of a strategy on all fronts uh, to look at these other issues that do affect uh, taxes in this community as uh, is much in evidence here in this graph. I'd appreciate any feedback that, uh, unless you think we're doing enough now, but I, I suspect there's always some more we can do, and, and to highlight these points so that members at other levels can address them as well. Mike? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the uh, council raises a number of good points that we'll be discussing with council in the next uh, few months when we present our tax policies or tax competitiveness. So we'll speak about our tax ratios and the restrictions that the province imposes on municipalities such as Hamilton with respect to our industrial tax ratio, uh, as well as the business education tax rates uh, when we pre present our tax competitiveness uh, study. So over the next few months, uh, we'll be reporting to council with respect to the policies and tax rates that uh, may lead into some discussions with respect to provincial legislation. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that, and perhaps we can try a little harder to highlight these and keep them and again, at the front of our discussion. On that very valid point, the downloading file is incorporated into this discussion as well, Mike, is that correct? For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes, and through the uh, Fairness to Hamilton right. Committee as well. Right. Thank you. Moving on, we have uh, Councilor Whitehead for a second time. Chart is uh, appropriate uh, chart, I, and I think Councillor uh, Ferguson's comments is, is not something we should ignore in regards to what it reflects on its own. But if I took an overlay, and I'm, I'm looking at residential, and for example, and it doesn't, and it's the same application on the industrial. Um, you can move from uh, uh, Oakville or Toronto and invest in home here and have a, you know, $350,000 home might be uh, a very small square footage, square, or small lot in a townhouse in, say, uh, uh, Oakville, and you get a beautiful home in Hamilton, so you get a lot more value for the dollars as you're investing. It's not much different on the industrial side, so I've overlapped, but you did have another chart there. I, I, I overlapped uh, the cost of uh, uh, industrial lands, for example. Um, most of those comparators, are, 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 our lands are relatively inexpensive and very competitive in cost. So for the same amount of money you spend in, in uh, for an acre in, in Markham, you could probably get two acres in Hamilton. I'm just hypothetically putting it forward. So I guess what, what you need context when these go up, and I'm hoping that and I, and I need, we need to build that strategy around that, is that uh, the five two percent. But what do you? What what else uh, is, is part of the consideration? Well, uh, what's land values? What's the? Uh, we mentioned the DCs. Uh, those are all uh, financial relative uh, um, considerations uh, for investment in a community. We're going like gangbusters on the residential side. Uh, there's got to be a reason for it. And most of these people are coming from the GTA and moving into Hamilton. They see they're getting more value. Even though the taxes are slightly higher in some aspects, they're getting more value for the dollars. Doesn't that apply on the industrial side as well? Absolutely. So I think that when you look at this, it goes back to my earlier comment, you have to look at all of the math related to this calculation of what it means. The real estate community looks at this and they say, well, if my taxes are high, that means my rent is lower because my overall occupancy costs are fixed when I compare it to other communities. The users are only prepared to pay so much. So when you look at that overall equation in terms of what it costs to reproduce 
you know, an industrial building. Hamilton, of course, will be lower because of lower land, but construction costs will be the same. And so you have to factor that in as part of this analysis. So again, I guess the comment there would be, Really important to do the homework. Really important to understand all of the metrics that go into this. Um, the other comment that I would make is that these are largely the GTA communities, the GTA locations. It doesn't include a London or a Kitchener or a Windsor. These are GTA which, in, for all intents and purposes, to attract the industrial development dollars are where you need to target for this particular asset class. So uh, the reason I raise that is that uh, when you look at 5.2, uh, the assessment on the property is a million, relatively speaking, in Hamilton, and the same uh, 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 property in Mississauga is two million, then the 5.2 percent on the uh, annualized taxes is actually higher than what the actual company would pay in uh, those other communities versus the Hamilton scenario. So when you're talking about just the financial component and you really start breaking it down and appreciating the assessment values and, and, and land costs and so forth, that 5.2% of a small number versus 5.2% of a large number, in fact, doesn't put Hamilton at a, 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 a competitive disadvantage. We do not agree with that. Uh, so I think your tax rates are higher than all the GTA communities when we go back to perception. So this is now a perception issue and it's up to the individual developer, investor to do the math behind it to say, does this investment decision make sense for me on this particular site based on all the equations and inputs that we talked about? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Now we have uh, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor and Sheila. Nice to meet you. Thank you for the presentation. A uh, couple of questions. So staying with this slide, I'm just curious, why did you break out Hamilton into the various former suburban municipalities? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please. So this was just entirely for the purposes of the study so that the team would know if there was a difference for each one of the various uh, communities within the Hamilton uh, you know, Census Metropolitan Area overall. I don't understand the reason for that as one city. Can somebody help me understand that? Am I missing something? Yeah, I'm just curious as to, Norm, can you help me with that further, please, Norm? Yes, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, to the Councillor. Uh, when it comes to, to tax rates, when we're dealing with companies, um, a location decision, whether they're going to Stony Creek or Ancaster, although we have one uniform development charge rate, we still don't have a uniform tax rate. So there is a difference in terms of the, uh, the tax rates between the different municipalities when it comes to an industrial location. Well, for those who are strong on brownfield development, um, I guess some potential new company wanting to come to Hamilton, if they just looked at this slide, and they wanted to come, hopefully, to Hamilton. Uh, for those of my colleagues who are always championing uh, the brownfield development, this doesn't help that uh, potential cause. So anyways, I just leave, Norm, I leave that thought with you and Sheila in terms of other municipalities, Toronto, of course, is amalgamated. I don't see them broken out into the Etobicoke's and Scarborough's and things like that. So I just found that a bit curious and a bit odd. Um, Sheila, obviously a lot has been asked about this slide versus the slide you showed, the good news slide, of relatively low competitive development and real estate costs. So in your opinion, you put those two slides up at a conference. What are potential investors, where's their preference? What are they looking for then? Because you told us we're terrific at low DCs and real estate costs, but we got a tax issue. So, and, but everybody, from what I'm seeing in provincial planning, policy announcements, Hamilton has suddenly, wonderfully, long overdue, become the center of the universe in the southwestern Ontario area. So Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Sheila for a further comment, please. Um, so as an investor, first of all, I wouldn't put this slide up for a general audience because it would not be suitable for a general audience. This is more specifically for the city of Hamilton. <laughs> so therefore, that, I have to you know, dispel that opportunity. I appreciate that, but it's in the public domain now. But carry on, please. I'm looking um, forward to your answer. Respectfully, a number of other municipalities do the same work. So they would have the same analysis, except for Hamilton would be on, on the high side of that analysis. You'll ask the question next in terms of the real estate investor, how they go about making their investment decisions. So they will look at a piece of land or a redevelopment deal and say, what is that redevelopment deal in Hamilton versus one that I may have in Mississauga, Vaughan, Etobicoke, or Vancouver, or Calgary? 
And so the largest investors look at that play, and now they're down in the middle U.S. trying to look at opportunities there. So suddenly Hamilton competes in that broader area, even for real estate investment dollars. Each site would be analyzed, due diligence detail on what could be accomplished with respect to that site and the development opportunity. This is one of the many inputs to that decision-making process. So you can't say it's in and of itself, it's alone, but it's one of the many inputs to that process. So okay. I think you need to understand the the financials and the homework that goes into that before you can come up with the right answer for Hamilton. Okay. Um, lastly, can you turn to the slide? I think it's a few after this one, Sheila, that says uh, about the uh, manufacturing leaders note about uh, need to evolve and capture innovation, advanced technology. Uh, it's a few slides after this one, please. I'll stop you where it's um, one more, I think. That's it. So, Sheila, I am quite flabbergasted by a couple of the bullet points on here. So I don't know who you talk to. That's none of my business. But you talk to numerous leaders in Hamilton's manufacturing community. And our image and positioning needs to change. And the last bullet point, positive quality of life. Now, I'm sorry to brag, but I like to think we're winning awards for our quality of life being second to none and many people and families moving to Hamilton because they got a great library system, conservation area, waterfront trails, recreation parks, escarpment. I, I'm having trouble with that one. Ms. Deputy Mayor, through to Sheila for an explanation or comment, please. So this goes back to perception. It doesn't go back to reality in terms of what's here. Of course, we all know it's a wonderful community to live in with tremendous quality of life and live work uh, life balances that are there. It's about perception, it's about branding, and it's about marketing. So from the marketing perspective, which is the repositioning on the marketing front, there's opportunities for you to profile the advanced manufacturing, identify strengths and weaknesses, in, or sorry, strengths and assets within that sector, and also to promote the wonderful quality of life that's here in Hamilton. When we do site selection studies for large users of hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, they always care about the quality of life within a local community. So it's really important to profile that properly to take advantage of the assets that Hamilton has to offer. Well, I guess I'll leave that challenge with our fine economic development director, Neil Everson, and his team and through the um, tourism department of the city of Hamilton and our excellent um, communications manager, Mike Kirkopoulos, Mr. City Manager, because I thought this was something that last bullet point we were most definitely uh, promoting, proud of, um, happy to tell the world, winning awards across uh, our entire community. And boy, if that's a perceptual problem still, uh, we've got a lot of uh, work to do in terms of um, properly advertising uh, why Hamilton's a great place at least to live, work, and play, and hopefully the investment will follow. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Duval, can you take the chair, please? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sheila, what I find interesting is that everything that uh, we've captured um, from a perceptual standpoint is negative. So through you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, you, everything that we've, we've um, identified as a, as a concern from a perceptual standpoint is the perception you're communicating. And I find it... I find it interesting in that if it's really not based on reality but perception, then it's being concluded based on ignorance and not the actual knowledge that, that we need to communicate. So the fact that the ignorance exists through you, Mr. Chairman, about the city, and I think that's what we've just concluded here because you're saying it's not reality, it's perception. How can we engage a process that eliminates that ignorance uh, throughout, I guess, the country. So we spoke about, the report has a number of ideas and opportunities that we could really speak to and, and we can go on forever on the, on the topic, but it's about branding and it's about marketing. And so when you talk about brand, if you've got your major population driving over the Skyway Bridge and looking over and seeing the Bayfront, there's a marketing opportunity. There's a rebranding opportunity because that perception 
um, it kind of goes against this quality of life and sustainable environment. So how do you take that asset and opportunity? Because you've certainly got tremendous traffic going down the highway. How do you turn that into a positive? How do you reposition and rebrand? That's one example. And you start to build on that with respect to marketing materials, you know, uh, publications and other elements that are wonderful here in Hamilton to really make a campaign around the attributes of Hamilton. Okay, so in essence, just expanding through you, Mr. Chairman, of what we're already doing. And through you, Mr. Chairman, as you're probably aware, Sheila, we have thousands of Torontonians relocating to Hamilton with that ignorant perception of, of Hamilton. And then that ignorance is eliminated once they are subjected to the reality of the city. So um, through you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, from a communication standpoint, should we be focusing in on the residential component or the industrial component or a joint venture where the our, our primary objective of eliminating this ignorance rather than communicating it would be uh, in our in our best interest so should it be a, a global branding re repurposing or reinvention of ourselves or should it be through action and communication of the existing people who are relocating who come here and are flabbergasted by that ignorance that's being communicated outside of the city and saying, I can't believe how beautiful the city is, how sustainable the city is, how successful uh, the city is, and how many opportunities exist in the city. So to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, how can we better communicate that more over and above what we're already doing? Because I think we're doing a pretty good job at that, um, just based on the thousands of people that are relocating here. Our property values are increasing. Uh, actually, we've been, I believe, uh, selected as the number one city in Canada to invest in, Ontario to invest in. We've had North American, if not international, recognition accordingly, which flies in the face of all this ignorance that, that's out there. And I'm to you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, how do we reconcile the ignorance that led to these conclusions? Asking me that Absolutely. question. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure of that. So I think there's an, you know, there's tremendous attributes for Hamilton. We highlighted all of those attributes. It, it really has a lot going for it. And certainly, uh, the study was completed a number of months ago, and I think the accolades that the city has received since that time have been wonderful. So you're obviously doing many of the right things. So that is absolutely important. From an economic development advanced manufacturing perspective, there's an opportunity to position this area in terms of innovation, advanced manufacturing, and growth, and develop a whole brand and marketing strategy around that. How that aligns with your residential strategy, I'll leave that and to you and to your marketing folks to kind of address that question. But in terms of the advanced manufacturing for economic development, you have a tremendous opportunity. Okay, and through you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think a number of the other issues that, uh, and variables uh, that I think needs to be exposed in, in more detail is comparing apples to apples. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, not all cities in Ontario are created equal. And some of those comparisons, uh, I think, are unfair in that because not all communities are created equal, to put us into the same category as, for instance, a Mississauga um, would, in essence, be putting us in an apples to oranges comparisons based on some of the challenges that we're faced with. Particularly, Mr. Chairman, our aging infrastructure, particularly, Mr. Chairman, the fact that only 40, we actually only control 45% of our operating budget, 55% of what we tax for has nothing to do with this council or the city and everything to do with the province. So in communicating all of these issues, if, if we're going to identify the problem, we need to identify the problem holistically. And I don't think we've done that today. I think we, we're looking at numbers, we're comparing apples to oranges without expanding upon it to clarify why we are in the position that we're in today. So to you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, how can we reconcile that? So the study has been very focused on economic development and advanced manufacturing. It's not addressed the overall marketing or brand or economic development strategy for the city of Hamilton. That wasn't the purpose or the intent. So within the advanced manufacturing study or sector, I think there's a holistic a set of facts onto which you can build a really good strategy. And so the strategy, the highlights are pointed out in the full book, and I think that as you move forward down that path, I think it's a five or ten year journey. And so I think being very purposeful on that strategy in terms of which sectors, how you're going to target them is very, very important. And being respectful of the math with respect to the real estate decision makers. Okay, so 
I guess my, my point to you, Mr. Chairman, is now that we, we know that uh, what, what the, we've identified the problem, we know what the presenting problem is, and the presenting problem is really ignorance more than reality. Now, how do we take that one step towards putting a plan of action together to basically eliminate that ignorance? Uh, in your recommendations, I notice um, that you've provided some, and I know Councilor Collins uh, will be bringing forward a motion accordingly, but a lot of this to you, Mr. Chairman, has uh, more, I guess, to do with pie-in-the-sky type of initiatives more than tangible, let's take plan A and move to plan B scenario, um, initiatives. So more, more tangible to the point, yes, you need to do this to improve this type of scenario. So how can we take this and expand upon it to make it far more tangible and realistic to you, Mr. Chairman? So a number of initiatives were made, at, again, at the high level. That was the intention of the study, not to drill down into detail. And so at the high level, we've identified the clusters to go after, the overall strategy to be developed, and these are some of the key points to do. That needs to go from a strategic document down to the next layer of how you're tactically going to go after that marketplace and what would you do and what are all of the components from Hamilton to play into it. Okay, so lastly, Mr. Chairman, what I've gathered from this presentation is that in reality, Hamilton being that we've been recognized as the number one city in Canada, number one in Ontario, national and international recognition accordingly, the fact that uh, we have tens of thousands of people seeking or thousands of people moving to the city as a result of how successful we are, that really our strength is the city itself, and Hamilton has a lot more to offer than what people know, and as a result of that, we need to focus in on eliminating that ignorance through you, Mr. Chairman, by rebranding ourselves accordingly. Would that be a fair assumption? I think there's a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of all that you have today and build it to the next level. And certain elements need to be repositioned. We spoke of some of them, but others, you're already doing a great job, so just build on that further. Uh, excellent, and I think that's a real valid point, and that really the campaign should be Hamilton more than you think, and you might be ignorant if you think otherwise. So, through you, Mr. Chairman, I'll take the chair back, and Councillor Collins, I believe you have a motion. Yep, thanks. I would first uh, move uh, to receive the report. Seconded by Councillor Jackson. Uh, all in favor? Carried. Carried. And then I would, um, thanks, and I would move that... Um, staff prepare a report that focuses on the recommendations contained in the Deloitte presentation and um, that the report be presented to a future JSC meeting. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Many thanks, Sheila. Have a great day. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have now... Uh, we, we have an issue, and Madam Clerk, we're, we're actually going to alter what our original plan is. Madam Clerk, can you expand upon uh, what we're going to be proceeding with? Yes, through the Chair, staff has requested that the presentation on item 7.2 be provided to the committee first, as there is information uh, in that presentation that may assist the committee when we move in camera on the labour relations issue. Thank you. And that would be Dan's uh, report. Dan, welcome. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Just run through it. Whoops. I'm going to turn. Okay. Yeah.
And the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, happy to be uh, here to give you a very brief update on the biosolids program and project and uh, where we are with the P3 Canada funding. Just to give you a very quick uh, reminder of where we've been with this project to date, I'll uh, just point out that on February 6th of 2013, we uh, received council approval on some key decisions uh, that P3 Canada had it requested of us, and on December 18th, uh, David Sweet was here to make the announcement that uh, the federal government was indeed supporting our project, so that was great news. Some of the key uh, highlights of the business case that I just want to remind Council of is that this will be a design, build, finance, operate, and maintain uh, scheme as far as the 30-year uh, the concession goes. And this is a, this is a very uh, typical P3 Canada uh, delivery model. The, the term is 30 years. The site where we will be delivering this project, again, will be Woodward Avenue. Uh, the technology uh, that we're going to be looking at through this process will be uh, enhanced treatment or thermal reduction. And those are the two categories of technology that we've uh, spoken about before. And uh, those will be the ones that we're pursuing. And just as a reminder as well that the affordability cap that we've set for this project is $111 million over the 30-year uh, concession. This is just a, a quick timeline of where we expect to go uh, once we, uh, uh, should we get up, approval to move forward today. And uh, I won't go over it, but uh, you can see that it extends right out to May of 2049. And we hope to have the, uh, the commissioning of whatever the facility might be in May of uh, 2019. Some of the key considerations and issues that we have in front of us today are uh, the existing contract, as most of you are aware, uh, we have some problems with that. Our current biosolids management contractor does not have a storage facility, which means that we are currently landfilling our biosolids, which is not the, certainly not the intent of the program that we have. Uh, for the last uh, 16, 17 years, we have been beneficially reusing the material, but as a result of some, uh, some issues on the contractor side, uh, they no longer have storage, so they'll be landfilling it, landfilling it, certainly until the better weather when they can begin to land apply again. And uh, that doesn't cause any contractual issues for us because our biosolids are meeting all the uh, in input specifications that we're required to. One of the key steps that uh, after we move forward today is the biosolids uh, master plan that we concluded in 2007 had uh, identified thermal reduction as the preferred solution for um, for a long-term uh, program management. One of the things that we will have to do uh, as a result of Council's wish to uh, allow other technologies to compete for this is to go back and do an EA amendment and uh, we are still working through the details of that and uh, after today we will require some, uh, some outside help with that with our transaction advisors and uh, that will be a process that we'll have to undertake to allow ourselves to entertain the idea of enhanced treatment as well seeing as the original environmental assessment concluded with thermal reduction. So uh, we don't see any big showstoppers there but we will have to turn our mind to what the details are for that process going forward. One of the things that's in the uh, recommendations today is also to approve uh, uh, us to move forward and secure the services of a transaction advisor. And essentially what that is is a team of uh, uh, professionals who provide engineering, financial, and legal disciplines in order for us to craft the document that we'll be putting out on the street. As you can imagine, the uh, uh, contract that's going to span 30 years requires a lot of uh, detail, so the transaction advisors would be the folks who help us put that together uh, with the intent of putting that on the street uh, uh, sometime next year. And then one other highlight that we're going to be uh, doing our best to, uh, to encourage through the procurement is there'll be a base bid for providing the service uh, kind of at a, uh, at a basic level, but we also want to try to introduce an aspect or possibly an alternative bid where proponents can bring forward innovation to see whether or not there's opportunities to reduce our costs even more by leveraging the innovation that exists within the private sector. So what you have before you is uh, these recommendations, and uh, I won't read them over again, but you can see them there. And essentially, uh, this is, uh, if I can characterize it as the uh, kind of a no-go, go-no-go no -go, uh, uh, moment for us. We will uh, be moving forward with the, uh, the transaction advisors and hopefully getting this, uh, this procurement really uh, moving forward in the next 12 months. And um, we did, uh, you've seen this um, process map before, I guess, and I apologize. The... Uh, I don't know if I can get this to work. So I don't know if you can read this very well on your print. I didn't notice it until after it was printed, but uh, you can't read it very well on your uh, document. So 
Just want to make sure that you understand what that is. We would be moving to the RFP stage, uh, and then uh, we'd be back in front of council at this point sometime in the future. I guess the one caution uh, that I would uh, provide is that um, at that point, we will have probably spent $2 million uh, to put the procurement out on the street. Uh, the vendors who respond to this will probably spend upwards of a million and a half dollars as well. So while this is a check-in right here, um, today is really kind of that moment where we're, I guess you can characterize it, we're going all in. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that as well. So, um, And that's it. I wanted to be brief today, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, we have a list of speakers. Is Councillor Pearson, yeah, thank you. Councillor Jackson, Ferguson, and Powers. So. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thank you. Great to, uh, to be here today. Um, it's been a long haul to get to this point. So right now, could you put that last slide that you were on? I just want to be sure. Right now we're at, um, where's this council approval uh, in, in the gray box at the bottom? Is that where we're at? No, Up there. We're right here. That, we're right there now. Yeah, okay. we had hoped to be here last fall. Uh, unfortunately, we... Uh, uh, we didn't get the announcement from P3 Canada until December the 18th, and it took us a little bit of time to get uh, our uh, information together so we could be here today. So that's where we are today. And then with Council's approval, then we'll move off to securing our transaction advisors and then moving forward with the uh, request for qualification stage, the RFP stage. And then theoretically, when we're back in front of you, we will have a recommendation for a successful proponent at that point. But it's one more opportunity, not saying I want to go there, of a no-go at that point. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Uh, certainly would be uh, create some problems if we got to that point and they decided to uh, take, a, take a left turn, if you will. But um, that's why I, I want to emphasize that today it's, uh, is an important decision. So That's why I want to be sure that we understand yeah. that's where we're at. So to be at this point now, we're processing this point. We're about, about two million. We're just two million into it now. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, so at this moment, I don't have the figure in front of me. Um, we, we haven't spent the $2 million that I referred to earlier. Right. So what will happen now is in the, um, the recommendations in front of you, this will be the authority for us to move forward, likely spending about $2 million to put together the contract. So we haven't spent that money yet. Um, I don't have a firm number as to what we spent so far to get through the process here today. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And the only question I just want to ask in slide three um, I just want to be sure process going forward. I guess these are all going to be set out in contracts, but it says there that little line commercial risk due to sale of end product. When this whole process is done, it'll be the provider or the operator that will have control over the end product. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. If, if an enhanced treatment category of technology wins the day, uh, typically those result in a, a, a product that is sold to a secondary market, and all that responsibility will rest with the, uh, the successful proponent. So we will not ha have any risk there. Great. Thank you. I wanted to be sure that's clear. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Now we have uh, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Dan. Uh, this has been a fairly long journey. I am, and I'm just a little bit nervous of um, accepting today because I'm trying to get through your detailed report as well. And uh, even though you say if you go back to the your, your graph there showing the um, the maze of the uh, roadmap uh, right there, even though you're saying the bottom council approval with the little lingo no go is a final legal opportunity for us to take an exit ramp you're saying today really though commits a fair bit of more dollars through you mr deputy mayor to dan through you mr chair that's correct if we get to the point where we're right here in front of you if we decided to uh, stop the process then as i mentioned uh, a lot of folks will have spent a lot of money including the city um the uh the proponents who have responded to this uh proposal will have spent a fair bit of money uh, P3 Canada, is, who's along for the ride uh, as well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that would be disappointing for them to, to see us uh, stop the process at that point. So there'd be a lot invested at that point, and that's, that's again, why I'm, I'm re-emphasizing, you know, what this means today. So just to be clear, you've checked with legal counsel of the city that no go legally, forget dollars that may be spent, forget investment by interested parties, P3 Canada, but legally, if we want to jump there, there's no recourse legally we have to worry about. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay, that's clear. 
Um, so, Dan, can you further explain to me this transaction advisors group you want to set up and this fairness monitor group you want to set up with the three million today? Could you further dissect that for me, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you, please? Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the transaction advisors are a team of uh, professionals, including legal, finance, and engineering, who will put together the actual contract documents that we will put on the street uh, through the uh, RFP process. Uh, putting together a 30-year uh, uh, concession for somebody to design, build, finance, operate, and maintain uh, some kind of technology to manage our biosolids for the next 30 years. There's an incredible amount of uh, technical and legal detail that will be included in that document, as well as structuring the finances over the 30 years. So we need uh, to, to uh, pull together a team of professionals to write that document for us. Obviously, staff will be working with them as well. Internally, we'll have our own finance, legal, and, uh, and Hamilton Water staff working with them as well. Uh, but it's, it's a huge undertaking, and that's why we need an, an external team to help us with that, and we will do that through an RFP process as well. So, Dan, um, and forgive my ignorance, transaction I don't know how many transaction advisors are going to be on this multifaceted team of yours. Two and a half million bucks, I guess these guys come expensively, and you're going to have a fair number of them. I'm just, I'm trying to just get my, my head around that number and all these people experts that you're talking about Tom I need can you further explain that for me please like are they all coming at two hundred thousand dollars a piece then they'll be each working counselor for the next three years and I need about 20 of those guys and further just simplify it for me please yeah through you mr. chair uh, when we put our RFP together uh, to uh, to secure a transaction advisor we'll be identifying the scope of work obviously we'll be looking to them to identify kind of a time task matrix that will have the number of hours associated with each task one of the benefits we have is we're not one of the first ones out of the gate so we'll have uh, opportunity to look at what other communities have done as far as um, the, the type of tasks that were, are required uh, not unlike the uh, the hospital at West 5th and, and Fenton Avenue that was a p3 as well so the documents associated with that making sure that we understand all the risks associated with with the, uh, with the transfer of, uh, of this uh, activity over the 30 years. So uh, there, there is a considerable amount of work uh, to make sure that we've identified all the risks, that we've identified all the, uh, all the details, whether it be legal, financial, or engineering-wise, uh, to make sure it's, it's well understood by the bidding community. So there is a tremendous amount of work that has to go into this. Okay. Thank you for that um, answer. Fairness monitor, is that like some... Ombudsman that's going to oversee this project, or through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please, Dan. Through you, Mr. Chair, that, that's probably a good analogy. The fairness monitor is uh, um, P3 Canada likes to see this with their uh, with their projects to make sure that um, there are no uh, biases that can be challenged after the fact. So the fairness monitor will be uh, providing guidance to us with respect to the documents that we prepare to make sure that we're not uh, creating any biases one way or the other, and that the entire uh, the transaction remains fair and uh, and transparent. Okay, a couple of more questions, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I appreciate your indulgence here. So, Dan, the overall cost of this project, for this biosolids project, overall cost approximately is? Through you, Mr. Chair, we have set an affordability cap of $111 million over the 30-year concession. And essentially what that is, is we have taken our costs today, we've escalated them over the 30 years uh, with a CPI, and then we've also built in some uh, contingency, if you will, uh, to acknowledge the risk that would occur over the 30 years should we try to continue managing it ourselves. So when you add all that together, it comes up uh, to a total of $111 million. And we wanted to put that in our documents right up front uh, to make sure that the bidders who look at this, if they know very quickly that they can't get below that, we don't want them wasting their time and p3 who's approved us are in for about a quarter of that so roughly about 25 to 30 mil dan or did i misunderstand that through your mr chair typically the uh, p3 canada provides a 25 percent grant uh, the, the tricky part of this is it's only on the capital uh, component. So uh, depending on what we get, uh, we're not sure what the capital component will be. But so essentially they've maximized the, uh, the uh, contribution to 22.9 million 
um, as far as the, the ceiling that they'll go to. But again, depending on who wins the day, if their capital, for example, is only 50 million, they'll provide 25% of that. If the capital's uh, 90 million, they'll provide 25% of that because there's a capital component and then a long-term O&M component. So. so it sounds like we're in a 20 to $30 million range that we'll get from P3. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think they've capped it at $22.9 million. I'm just looking at Dan to confirm that. $22.9 million. So lastly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, so Dan, is this time sensitive today? Have I and my colleagues got a couple of weeks to review everything, meet with you and your team? This is a heck of a lot of money. I know we've been talking about this since the California company came unsolicited a number of years ago, wanting to do a similar type of project, if I recall. So I'm just trying to understand, is this time sensitive? You need an absolute answer today, yay or nay? Or have we got a couple of weeks? Because even though this may not be the sexiest project that our constituents will listen to and learn about or try to follow, uh, it's a whack of money to the, um, to the local rate payer. So you, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, on timetable, please, Dan. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, other than you know trying to maintain the schedule that we're, we're already slipping a little bit on it, we do have this issue with our existing contractor right now around this uh, storage. Um, but you know, if to characterize it as the proverbial gun at our head, we don't have a gun at our head at this moment. So um, I, I don't think that would be a huge disruption for us. Okay, that's what I wanted to know for my colleague's sake. And if I'm the only one, so be it. But I just want to know, Councilor, if I don't get a decision by midnight tonight, then you know what, the whole thing falls apart, P3 is pulled out. But you're saying that's not the case. That's correct. Okay, thanks so much, Dan. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dan, thanks for coming in today. I think it is, we, we, we may not uh, have hit the wall, but I think it's unconscionable. We're landfilling our biosolids when there's these other uses out there for it. and. And, and filling up landfills is not what we should be doing with this product. Um, I'm very pleased that what I see today is what I saw six months ago, and I saw a year ago, and I saw a year and a half ago. It hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. and, and so the roadmap is very clear where the exit ramps are, where you can get off. And, and you've always said when we get to that box we're at today that this last time you can get off with no cost. And, uh, but I think we need to go full steam ahead. I don't think we should be concerned. We, we should obviously be concerned about cost, but the 111 million is what we're paying today, indexed to the CPI. So at the very worst, we're going to be paying what we pay today, and and that should be. And it's going to become a bio product now that can be productive use, either as fertilizer or as ability to, as a fuel to generate electricity. And uh, so it's important we stay the course. Um, I had a personal experience with the Fairness Monitor when in my previous life we bid the 407 and fortunately we were successful in that. But it's critical because the bidders are spending a lot of money to put these together and they're all going to be looking for angles. I've been on the other side looking for angles to try to win this thing. And the Fairness Monitor will make sure that only questions are asked to one person, that one person will get the answers from the team of the technical people, that one person will answer it and everybody will get the exact same answer. And in addition to that, I suspect they will be told, like we were told in 407, you lobby one politician, you'll be disqualified. And because you're always trying to work that angle to get a political spin to this. So once the RFP is issued, I suspect we have to stop any communication with any, any person who's registered as a bidder. So I like it, Dan. I'm glad it's, going, it's moving forward. I guess the only concern I have is that you're opening up wide open to any type of emerging technology. And I'd like to see up on that screen what the consequences will be if it doesn't work. And, and uh, so I want that to be crystal clear that if you come in with a new technology to pelletize this and turn it into fertilizer that can be broadcast on farmer's field through conventional fertilizer spreaders and it don't work, what's the consequences and what security are they providing if it doesn't work? And, and so we're, you clearly indicated to us you're going to download that risk onto the proponents but, you know, sometimes we see these guys come in with a big oops sign up on the screen and, and try to turn it back on to us. So it's got to be very, very clear. And I want to personally see, and I think council should see, what it says. If it don't work, here's what the consequences are going to be. And you're putting up a bond or cash or some kind of security to make sure it does, that we can access if we have to do an emergency take back because it didn't work. So I'm fully supportive of the recommendations, Mr. Chairman, before us today, and I'll be happy to move it at the appropriate time. 
Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Um, actually, I'll take the motion now. Moved by Ferguson, and, 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 and people can speak. Hold on, we'll put it on the table. Oh, hey, oh. Seconded by Councillor Powers. Okay. Now we got we've got the recommendation on the table, even though I'm not supporting it. Now we have uh, Councillor Powers. No, and Councillor Ferguson said what's need to be done. It's uh, this comes as no surprise. What you have here is a process that uh, Mr. McKinnon has kept us advised all along the process, and uh, and we need to get on or get off and and turn the money back to the federal government if we have no interest in uh, in moving ahead with this project. Thank you, Councillor Powers. We have Councillor Farr. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, did you want to speak? Okay, Councillor Johnson. Floor is yours. Unless you want to lose it, I'll give it to someone else. Thank you. Um, through you, Deputy Mayor, to Dan, thank you very much for the update. I just wanted to get some things out on the in for public record. We know the answer to this, but I just want to get this out there. Liberty Energy came years ago, proposed this wonderful facility, state-of-the-art, and one of the things that was the, the key to their success was that they were going to accept bio-waste from 60-kilometer radius. So I just want to understand that we are not on market for accepting anywhere else but within the city. We're only going to take care of our own, or are we putting this out there so that we're allowing other waste to come in from other municipalities? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, this is just Hamilton's own material. We've never been given direction to do anything other than that, so. Okay, so I just want to get that on the record that this is for Hamilton Waste only. And location? To Mr. Chair, so Woodward Avenue. Thank you. Those are the two questions that I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor uh, Johnson. There are no further speakers, so we do have a motion on the... Oh, Councillor Collins, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I, I wanted to... Uh, weigh in on it and for me you know I've been consistent from the beginning and I, I appreciate all the information that's been provided but I haven't been convinced yet um, that this is the cheapest option for us and and there is a reason why 80 percent of municipalities are still utilizing the land application although it's coming with its challenges and staff said I thought we heard years ago not from our own staff but others that um, you know land application was going to be dismissed by the province that they'd be introducing legislation and they'd be limiting municipalities ability to land apply their biosolids on uh, agricultural lands only to find I think it was a year year and a half ago that the province actually loosened up the legislation and, and allowed it um, allowed municipalities um, to, uh, to apply it with it, legislation that made it easier to do so and so for me I have a trouble understanding how 80 percent of the municipalities um, are utilizing a method that is in my mind the cheapest option and it was great to hear Sheila today talk about the many challenges that our municipality face and it's issues like this where we start looking at the you know it's almost like that shiny uh, object syndrome where you're fascinated with something that's new and innovative and it's got a price tag attached to it that's um, absolutely enormous and, and when I look at the cost of simply treating it transporting it and then applying it versus the very complex um, system that we're going to create here, uh, I'm having great trouble understanding how this is a, even a break-even scenario at best. So I appreciate the information that's been provided. We've been down this road before with other big capital projects and other files, only to find out that years later that um, you know this is one of those reasons why we're not competing with other municipalities. And um, anyway, I appreciate all the hard work that's been done to date. I know that staff has done a tremendous amount of work in the background to make this happen. That's all at council direction. And um, But for those reasons, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I can't support this. I haven't in the past and I, I can't in the future. Okay, so uh, first time speaker is myself, so I'll pass the chair over to Councillor Whitehead. Um, along the same line, we have consistently not supported this endeavor. But more so over and above the affordability issue, and I, I think it was an oxymoron to suggest anything over $100 million is affordable. But having said that, um, I think it's important to recognize the location. And the location, as everyone recognizes, and the airshed associated with that location in East Hamilton, uh, is problematic. 
So from a quality of life perspective, uh, as, as one variable, uh, clearly we're adding to an already challenged airshed. And ironically, uh, we, we had a pilot project that was provincially driven by, in Oakville, by the province, which was purely politically motivated and quite laughable that it would be located in Oakville. But having said that, uh, clearly our, our challenges are far greater than that of any other uh, municipality, except I, I would say perhaps um, places that happen in Sudbury, I think, uh, fall within the same category. So to, to speak in, in, on one side of um, on one side of our, I don't want to say mouth because that's derogatory, but to speak in, in, in one day about, about quality of life issues and environmental concerns and, and stepping to the plate and ensuring that we improve air quality and all the cold red uh, references, we, we say that one day, but then we turn around and, and we propose something that actually exasperates those very things that we claim to be fighting. So from a financial perspective, I'm not convinced that this is the cheapest. Frankly, I think it's the most expensive. The province is, is no way going to be changing legislation. Frankly, they just recently amended it, up, updated it. So the spreading is not going to be discontinued. Uh, and frankly, as, as it's been mentioned by Councilor Collins, 80% of the municipalities just do that. So when you look at the environmental, you look at the social, you look at the financial, it simply doesn't add up in any way, shape, or form. So, and for those reasons, as I've done from day one, I'm, not, I'm strongly opposing it. Nothing personal. Dan, I like you a great deal. <laughs> uh, and the staff that's associated with this. I know you might, and staff believe this is a uh, route we should be taking. Uh, I know I speak on behalf of uh, my residents and the majority of the lower city residents in saying that they wouldn't support such a, such an endeavor. And for that, I can't support it. Thank you. And I'll take the chair back. Uh, uh, add Lloyd to your list as well. Okay, so we, we had second time speakers. First time, I think. Uh, you were first time? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Whitehead for the first time, then Farr, and then Ferguson. Um, What's interesting, and that's why I, lo I love this council, is that we do have a diverse uh, view and opinion on, on many issues. Um, I'm actually just the opposite. Uh, when I look at, um, I think China talks about the fact that uh, they plan 100 years ahead. They don't plan uh, on the horizon. They, they plan 100 years ahead. When we talk about provincial uh, uh, legislation enabling or not enabling, to me that's not as a big an issue is the fact that the market is going to drive what is taking place in regards to our ability to put this material on farms. We already know, uh, for example, that people are becoming much more savvy in what they eat, where it comes from. We know, uh, you know, we got uh, major drive-throughs are, are making steps to make changes in their dietary, uh, uh, and making and advertising as no hormones or, or no this or no that. People becoming much more aware where their foods are coming from, organics, non-organics, and so forth. So as this evolution continues, and we know that on waste to find another landfill. It takes a long time. It's a significant investment to make that decision. You can't make it uh, and then build it or, or identify it in the following year. It's a very expensive process. We've embarked on an option uh, that gives us stability in the context of uh, uh, not having those other forces come to bear to find us in a panic situation where, in fact, we will be spending a hell of a lot more money to deal with our waste. There's another principle here. You know, I, I, when, when I lived in LA Lake, I fought the whole issue of sitting uh, 44,000 trucks of radioactive waste in LA Lake, because I believe that those who produce the waste should be taking care of the waste. So I find it, uh, we, it was, if you adopt that principle, then obviously you're going to be a lot more conscious as a, as a community and as a citizenry to look at uh, the waste that's being produced and how you uh, 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 limit that waste or reduce that waste. That's a principle that we've all subscribed to. So when we talk about being uh, waste that's being produced by the, uh, the citizenry, I think we have an incumbent responsibility to ensure that we handle it and don't make it an issue for others. We've already heard challenges in storage in regards to the, the land application issue. Uh, we know there are farmers saying no 
to the application issue. And the, the, pro, the challenge is, as we move into the future, how many more farmers are going to say, we're not going to take that material because you still have uh, 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 metal, pharmaceutical, those kind of issues that you're now putting back into the soil, which is not an ideal situation when people becoming much more informed of what, uh, what they eat. So for those reasons, I'd rather have the stability in knowing that the out, the, the, these other forces are going to come to bear and create a, 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 a acute situation where we're going to have to strategize when all of a sudden we have no place to lay this stuff to take the opportunity of a, of, of a, a funding mechanism that's provided by the federal government to offset our cost. We may not have that opportunity when that other horizon arrives. We may find that we have to uh, fund it at 100 percent dollars, which is a heck of a lot uh, larger impact on the taxpayers of this community. So uh, I would only suggest to my colleagues that are, are looking at this, if you feel that I'm wrong about the fact that people are becoming much more educated and much more concerned and that uh, you don't think that farmers are going to start saying, you know what, I have some concerns because of some of the content in that material and people are becoming more informed so I want to make sure I'm not going to take and have this stuff uh, applied on my lands and that uh, that opportunity starts getting more restrictive and more restrictive and much more competitive and much more competitive and the costs go up and up and up. Um, if you want to take that risk, then power to you. I'm not prepared to take that risk. I think this is a, a good investment and provides long-term stability on this issue for the City of Hamilton. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. We have uh, Councillor Farr, then Councillor Ferguson, and then Councillor Jackson for a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A lot of great comments uh, whenever we're uh, dealing with this uh, debate, and today uh, obviously uh, monumental in improving this. Obviously, we move forward and uh, spend some millions and upwards to uh, 111, obviously, when all is said and done by 2017. And just to piggyback on Councillor Johnson's question, uh, definitively, Dan, are you saying through the chair here today that you know, we send you off and you're going to have this transaction advisor group um, uh, create uh, these uh, uh, RFPs, I guess. The proposals will come in. And definitively here today, you're saying that we'll take nothing that contemplates uh, biosolid management of any other community. We are only dealing with Hamilton, and we're only going to take proposals that deal with Hamilton through you. Chair. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Farr. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you. Just for clarification again on the affordability side, Dan, you put up the $111 million. It's going to be right in the RFP to show respondents this is all we're prepared to spend for the 30 years. And I think I heard you say, and just want you to repeat it again, that that's what it's costing us now, indexed to CPI. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. We did build in some contingency uh, along the way over a 30-year period. We had expected that something unforeseen would happen, and uh, I believe we built in $30 million, so about a million dollars a year. Uh, if we had to build a storage facility of our own, or we got caught in a situation where we had to go to land for a few years or landfill for a few years because our biosolids weren't meeting um, spec, then we wanted to build in. So there is there is some buffer there, if you will, from a contingency perspective, and it's it's just a little more than what we're going to get from. People. So when you, when you kind of add the two together, it's very close to what we're paying now. So. Okay, so the argument that um, the cheapest way to do this is to uh, land up and then apply, which is what we're doing now, it, it is not necessarily correct because if the land application is costing us what you set as the maximum we'll pay for this new technology, uh, it's not going to cost us a lot more money and it's not the most expensive route. Through you, Mr. Chair, that that was the idea of coming up with the affordability cap. And keep in mind that, you know, once once we go to a competitive environment, you know, if the vendors that Dan and I have talked to over the last number of years about this, they're all saying that that they'll be able to beat that pretty handily. But until they sign on the dotted line, you you never know what you're going to okay, get. So so. I, I just wanted to mention that I thought this we can't afford this. I can't. I don't think we can afford not to do it. And and of course, uh, I heard uh, that people say some people say that the easiest way to get rid of this, the cheapest way is to land up high and all you got to do is dry haul and spread. I think a very important word was left out and that was storage because you could only land apply this when there's no crops in the field, so you have to do spring or fall, and when there's no snow in the ground, which we had to have storage. And our contractor has lost his storage and we're landfilling right now, correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. 
So I, I, that's, that's where there's far more risk. And also, you talk about the environmental side. Picture a, a person who lives in the rural areas, and the farmer next to him is land applying our biosolids. So fresh human waste being spread on the field right outside his door. The odors blow you away. And in addition to that, who knows, Council Whitehead, who knows what the heck's in there? And, and uh, farmers are even getting uneasy with this. And the best example is Councillor Pasuda. He won't allow it now. He won't pay it to his farm. And, and, and so here we have a solution that's probably going to cost us less, certainly not going to cost us more, and we're not putting this stuff into the environment, into areas that can contaminate rural wells, which makes neighbors feel very, very uneasy. So I, I think it's very important that we take this to the next step, get the hard numbers in, understand the technology, and take it to the next steps. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. We now have Councillor Jackson and Collins for a second time. Councillor Jackson and McCaddy for a second time as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Your Jackson. first time? Oh, Councillor Collins, sorry. I said Councillor Jackson. Councillor McCaddy. Sorry, Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Mr. Deck Mayor. I uh, wanted to speak earlier and I decided not to, and I'm back at the microphone on this, but um, I just. Uh, wanted to uh, just take a little step backwards and, and Dan just through the uh, earlier part of this process there was, there was an environmental assessment uh, undertaking as if I remember correctly and at that point uh, the recommendation from the EA was was incineration as the technology that we would take forward into uh, p3 the thermal approach uh, but but you've you've added the uh, the second approach here uh, in in uh, what we've got in front of us, the, sorry, I've just lost the language of the second. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, enhanced treatment. Someone? Enhanced treatment, right. Correct. So, so we're, we're better off now in, in terms of the technologies. We're actually putting two technologies forward. The original one were the EA uh, rec recommendation, which was a long process to arrive at that, and, and uh, the second recommendation, uh, the advanced treatment, uh, provides additional options to uh, offer to the market. Maybe just touch on how that uh, how that happened, the adding an additional one, because I think we're in better shape today than we were uh, in the previous part of the, the process. Mr. Deputy Dan. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, when the biosolids master plan was completed in 2007, uh, thermal reduction was the preferred solution, and the context at the time included the fact that our biosolids uh, quality wasn't as good as uh, it could be. Uh, we had a couple of metals of concern. At that time, the idea of uh, a secondary market or a fertilizer at that time, the P3 market wasn't probably as mature as it is now, so at that time, the city would have been looking at marketing this material ourselves. So with the fact that we didn't have a, a great biosolids material at the time, there was lots of risk associated with selling a, a product to a secondary market. I think that's one, one, one of the main drivers why enhanced treatment, if you will, came off the table as far as a preferred solution, and we ended up with the thermal reduction. Thermal reduction certainly has a higher capital cost, but the risks are much lower. Um, there's no trucking, there's no storage, you don't have to have farm who are willing to take it, that kind of thing. So I think that's why it rose to the top through the original analysis. Uh, when we applied to P3 Canada, we were directed by council to open up the, uh, the categories of technologies that we'd be willing to look at. Uh, or, you know, the passage of time over the last seven years has revealed that uh, there are emerging technologies that seem to be very uh, reliable now. P3 Canada is in play now. So I think the fact that we're going to go back and do the EA amendment and uh, put enhanced treatment back on as a possibility I think is, is very appropriate. I think the length of time that we've had from 2007 to now has actually benefited us because now this is an option for us. And, and you know, there is a possibility that, that some category of technology within the enhanced treatment realm will be the winner of the day. So, um, so I think, you know, the, the fact that this process has moved along at the speed with, uh, with which it has has probably benefited us. Right. So that certainly gives me some comfort, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, that enhanced treatment is, is also one of the technologies in there, which I was interested in earlier on, and I'm glad we were able to add that as we move into the, uh, the critical phase of the P3 process. And as I, I've expressed concern in the past about incineration also and, and the potential for air quality uh, issues <coughs> associated with that. And I understand we don't have a, you know, the detailed uh, uh, what kind of incinerator we're talking about precisely in front of us uh, right now uh, today, but any any sense, any comfort you can provide to us, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, Dan, uh, uh, as to, to the thermal uh, treatment, to the incineration, uh, 
Has there been any advancement in the, in the technology on that based on what we've learned over the last uh, couple of years working on this process? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't think I can give you an intelligent answer to that. I think there's been small advancements. I mean, the basic premise of kind of a fluidized uh, bed incinerator has is, is, is been around for a while. Um, certainly, I don't think there's been as much uh, kind of advancement with the technology as there has been in the enhanced treatment kind of category or space. So um, I think what we had on the table then is very similar to what we have on the table now as far as the technologies. Typically, the, with incineration, it's all around your, your uh, emissions and how are you going to clean your flue, flue gas is that kind of thing so yeah okay well it's uh i really again I, i'll uh make my decision based on that enhanced treatment option being on the table now where it wasn't before uh going into the process i'm hopeful that uh, that's the direction we'll end up taking thanks mr deputy mayor um council jackson thanks mr deputy mayor um dan if this goes forward i'm part of it is a vote of confidence in uh, your leadership and your team with dan chauvin and John Savoya from finance and that, and I mean that very sincerely. So um, can I just further understand, Dan, before I vote, 10 years in your rates budget, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the way the, uh, the transaction would occur, and I'll use, uh, so it's a 30-year concession. Over the 30 years, we're committed to spend $111 million. If the capital component of that was, say, $50 million, and it takes three years to deliver the capital, we would spend the 50 over the first three years, of which we would get 25% from P3 Canada. The balance of that 111 million would be spread over the balance of the term up into 2049. So we would have a regular payment, uh, probably on a monthly basis, to the vendor over the next 27 years or uh, whatever it works out to be. So. Okay, thanks for explaining that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, and again, Dan, this is our in-house version, if you will, using my terminology of what Liberty and others were trying to suggest. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Dan, if you will. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Does differ from uh, Liberty Energy's proposal? We own this plant, right? This will be our plant that we're contracting with someone. Correct? That's my point. Through you, Mr. Chair, we would take ownership of it in, in, at the end of the 30 years. It would be on our property. Uh, this is very different than the Liberty proposal um, in the sense that um, it's just a relationship between us and, and the vendor. So, Correct. We so, own the airport, and we have a management company that has been overseeing it. So kind of similar that way, Dan, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through you, Mr. Chair. I'm not that familiar with the airport deal, but it sounds okay. like it's very similar. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Last question, Dan, for me to support this today then. You won't be coming, for whoever's on council next term, and if this is approved, you won't be coming forward and saying to the new council, you know what, council, I'd like to put more money towards flood prevention, towards upgrains to our infrastructure for water main replacement, sewer storm replacement. But you know, council, you, you approved that biosolids plan, that's $111 million, and to avoid future budget pressures, uh, that money now has, now, that money now has come in place of what I, That money might have come in place of what I could have done more to prevent flooding in the city of Hamilton in light of past uh, occurrences. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Dan for a comment on that, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think that's a fair statement. My hope would be that uh, it would actually be the opposite. We're going to have cost certainty over 30 years. Uh, we're going out to the market to get a competitive price for this uh, with new technologies. So I, I'm hoping that the opposite would be true, that it would be it would give us more cost certainty over the 30 years and, and hopefully uh, may even reduce our costs versus what we're paying now. And that, that really helps me in terms of uh, providing some comfort level for me. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Collins. Thanks. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, I, I understood a long time ago where this is going. Again, I thank staff for bringing it forward. We know that from even from the past presentation that image is a big thing for us. We're trying to rebrand ourselves as something different than we were from 1950. Who knows what this facility is going to look like? But I certainly understood a couple of years ago that the incineration or Liberty type uh, facility was find, going to find its way into the look at um, four in the past, um, like doesn't include a, a new incinerator with a, a scrap metal pile beside it, with uh, a chemical storage plant, with an asphalt tank farm. 
For me, it includes uh, other things and uh, other facilities. I mean, and you know this because we live through it with Liberty. Before we build this facility and somebody says, you know, wouldn't it be a great revenue opportunity for us to actually start to import waste from other facilities because we've made such a great investment in this facility, let's contract other mun municipalities to ship their waste to Hamilton and we're going to treat it here in this new facility and we're going to make money off it. And that's the types of decisions and it's, it's, it's going to happen because it already happened with Liberty. We had people around this table who rolled out the red carpet and said anything we can do for Liberty for them to make their investment, we're going to sacrifice the environment sh uh, environmental air shed here locally to make a quick buck and that's what's going to happen with this. That doesn't happen with biosolids, so you can talk all you want about this is e break even or we're improving the situation. The fact that 80% of municipalities in Ontario are doing it another way I think is proof in the pudding that it's the cheapest and for their residents it's the best method of disposal. Thank you. Um, now, any further speakers? Hearing none, may I have a, a motion to receive? Uh, oh, moved by Pearson, seconded by Partridge. All in favor? Carried. Thanks, Dan. Okay, now, uh, may I have a, um, a motion to approve the recommendation? I'm asking for a standing recorded vote uh, on, on the approval of the recommendation. All in favor? Councillors Pearson, Ferguson, Powers, Partridge, Herbertina, Councillors Whitehead, Duval, Jackson, Morrow, Farr, McCaddy. Those opposed? Deputy Mayor Marula and Councillor Collins. Okay, therefore it is carried. Moving on, members of committee. <laughs> um, members of committee, are there any questions with respect uh, to uh, item uh, 8.1 on the schedule? Oh, we have to go into camera, right? Sorry. Uh, may I have a motion to go into camera? Moved by. Uh,